All right, so in this video, I'm gonna go over the layout basics. I'm not gonna get too much into the menu or the toolbar or how to customize the toolbar. Uh, I'm just gonna stick with the basics of the layout. Okay, so let's get right into it. So every time you create a new file in Microsoft Excel, you create what's called a workbook. Now each workbook is comprised of different worksheets as indicated here on the bottom left hand corner. Okay, now you could add a new worksheet by clicking on this plus uh, this plus sign. Okay, you could rename a sheet by double clicking on the sheet and typing into it. So let's call this sheet ready and this sheet Excel. Now, every time you add a new sheet, the default name is to call it sheet and then whatever whatever number sheet you're on. Now, let me go ahead and delete this sheet that I just added by right-clicking on it and then selecting delete. Okay, so each worksheet is comprised of columns as indicated by letters and rows as indicated by numbers. Now, I know what you're thinking. What happens once you get to column Z? Well, then it goes to column AA, column AB, and so forth. You could have up to 16,000 columns and around 1 million rows. Now, the intersection of a column and a row is referred to as a cell. So, for instance, the intersection of column A and row 1 is referred to as cell A1. The intersection of column B and row 1 is referred to as B1. Um, the intersection of column A and row 2 is cell A2, and the intersection of column B and row 2 is cell B2, and so forth. A lot of the time, you'll hear people refer to a cell range, and it's nothing more than that. A cell range is a range of cells. So when I select this cell range, I'm selecting cell range A1 colon a9. So that's referred to as A1 colon A9. If I select A1 through B9, that's referred to as A1 colon B9. Now, data can be typed directly into a cell or into this formula bar right up here. Okay, so I'm going to type ready, okay, by typing into that formula bar. But now I'm going to type directly into the Excel or, or sorry, di directly into the cell without using the formula bar. So let me type Excel right there. You could resize a column or a row by hovering your mouse between column A and column B. And once you do that, you should see this little icon pop up. You can make a column more narrow or you can make it more wide. There's also a, a feature called auto size. So let's say the column is more narrow um, than the data in the column. Well, all I have to do is come over here and double click and it automatically resizes it. Now let's make our row larger than it should be and then let me double click and it automatically resizes it. So let me add some more data into these cells. Okay, now if you select multiple columns or rows for that matter at the same time, and you resize it, all of them are gonna become the same width. So right now, I'm resizing it to 30 pixels. So as you can see, columns A through D all became 30 pixels, okay? Now, I could also auto size all of them at the same time. Just all you have to do is make sure they're selected and then double click to auto size. There's another way of doing it without having to select the columns. Okay, so what you could do is click on this top left corner, and basically what that is, is a select all. And once everything is all selected, all you have to do is a double click to resize, and it resizes everything. And the auto resize is something that I use all the time, and it's gonna be something that you end up using all the time. All right, so in this video, we're gonna go over the cell and formula fundamentals, okay? Now, what exactly is a formula? Well, a formula is an expression that calculates the value of a cell, okay? So let's get right into an example, okay? So, how do we initiate a formula? Well, we initiate a formula by typing the equal symbol, 
okay? Now on a side note, you can actually initiate a formula by using either the plus or the minus sign, um, but I tend to use the equal symbol, as do most other people, okay? So you can actually reference data within another cell within your formula. So let's say we wanted to reference data from cell A1 in cell A3. Well, we could do that by typing up A1 in our formula, okay? Now, if we change the data in cell A1, cell A3 will change to reflect that, okay? So let's undo what we just did. Now, as you just saw, I actually manually typed in A1, but you don't necessarily have to do that. You can actually click on the cell that you want to reference once you're in your formula, like I just did right here, okay? Now, not only can you reference cells within your worksheet, but you can also reference cells within other worksheets or within whole different workbooks for that matter, okay? So let's take a look at how we reference cells in another worksheet, okay? So let's say I wanted to reference cell A1 within sheet number two, which we have right over here. Well, I do that by typing up sheet two, okay? Then I use an explanation point, okay? Then I type cell A1, okay? So that's how it's supposed to look. You have the sheet name followed by the explanation point followed by the cell that you want to reference, okay? Now, you can also reference data within cells within whole different workbooks, okay? And how do we do that? Well, I happen to have another workbook open already, okay? So let's delete what we have, type our equal symbol, okay? Come over here to our new workbook, and click on the cell that we want to reference, okay? And there we have it, some data in another workbook. And what does this formula look like? Well, you have a single quote followed by a an open bracket, okay? Then within that open, within those brackets, um, you have the file name, okay? Close brackets, then you have the sheet name, okay? Which the sheet name in this case is sheet one. Okay, close your parentheses, and then you have your cell reference, okay? Try not to worry about these dollar symbols right now. We'll get a little bit more into that later, um, but that's how it's supposed to look. Now, that's actually how it looks when we have it open, okay? We actually have this file open, but let's see what it looks like when we close this file. Okay, so now we close the file, and let's see our formula. See, the formula actually is referencing a path to that file, okay? Once you have the file closed, it's going to reference the path to where the, that file is actually, actually located on your computer, okay? Okay, so let's delete our formula and let's go with our original formula, which was um, A1, okay? Now, let's try copying this formula to cell B3. Now, as you can see, it actually copied the data from cell B1 rather than the data from cell uh, A1. Now, why did it do that? Well, I want to get into the specifics of that along with simple arithmetic formulas in our next video. All right, so in this video, we're gonna be going over basic arithmetic formulas, uh, and we're also gonna be getting into the difference between relative cell references and absolute cell references, okay? So let's go ahead and dive right into it, okay? So in this example, in column B, we have our quantity, and in column C, we have our price, okay? So what do we wanna do? Well, in column D, we wanna calculate our total, which is gonna be our quantity times our price, okay? So how do we do this? Well, first we initiate our formula by typing in the equal symbol, okay? And now let's type 11 times 90, okay? And that gives us our result, which is 990, okay? Now, as we just learned in our previous video, we don't actually have to type in 11 and 90. We could actually just reference these cells, okay? So we say B2 times C2, okay? And that also gives us our uh, desired calculation. 
So before I continue on with this example, I wanted to go over the different uh, math symbols that that Microsoft Excel uses, okay? So the one that we just went over was multiplication, and for that, we use an asterisk, okay? We use a backslash for division. We use the dash or or the minus button for subtraction, and obviously, we use the plus sign for addition, okay? We can also use a caret symbol for exponents, okay? For instance, the formula equals 2 caret 3, is the same as saying two to the third power, which will return the number eight. So let's get back to the example, okay? So we have the total for cell D2, which is cell B2 times C2, okay? And now we want the same formula being copied down to cells D3 through D7, okay? What's a quick way to do that? Well, we could click on cell D2, and then we, we type on our keyboard control C, which is a copy. Now let's highlight cells uh, D3 through D7 and then type control V on our keyboard, okay? And that's a quick way to do this calculation. So if we double click on D7, the formula pops up, okay? And this formula is referencing cell B7 and cell C7, okay? Well, how does Microsoft Excel know to do that? It knows to do that because it's using a relative cell reference, okay, which we're going to get a little bit more into later. But I also want you to notice that the text B7 within this formula is this uh, little blue color. And if you actually look at B7, the cell is highlighted with that same blue color. And the same applies to C7 and this red color, okay? And that's a neat little feature that Excel has so that you can remember which cells you're referencing in your formulas, okay? Now, let's suppose we wanted to calculate our grand total, which is the total of all the values in column D. First of all, a quick way to, to calculate your total is to highlight all the cells that you wanna calculate the total for, and then look in here at the bottom right-hand corner and seeing where it says sum. So as you can see, the sum of all these cells that we have highlighted is 6,254. It also provides us with a count and with an average, okay? So that's a neat little feature, but let's suppose we actually wanted it on our worksheet. Well, let's come over here to C8. Let's type grand total. And as you can see, it kind of uh, bleeds over into column D. So let's try um, using what we just learned in our last lesson, which is a resize, and double click in between C and D to do auto resize. So how do we calculate the sum of all these values? Well, one way to do it is to add up each value individually. And that gives us 6,254. Okay, but there has to be an easier way to do it because what if you had a thousand rows and you had to add up each cell individually? Well, luckily for us, Microsoft Excel has a built-in function called the sum function, okay? So let's talk a little bit about functions first. So Microsoft Excel has a huge library of built-in functions, okay? Now each function consists of two parts. You have the function name and you have the function arguments. Function arguments are enclosed by parentheses and are separated by commas, okay? Optional arguments are enclosed by brackets. Now, all of this uh, might seem a little bit confusing right now, but it will make a lot more sense uh, once we start looking at examples. So let's take a closer look at the sum function. So the first thing we need to do is delete what we already have in D8, okay? Now, let's initiate our sum function by typing the equal sign and starting to type the function name, okay? Now, as you can see, as we typed in our function name, Microsoft Excel automatically populated a list of all of its built-in functions that contain the characters S-U-M, okay? So we just need this first one, sum. So let's go ahead and double click on it, okay? Now, Microsoft Excel is asking for its arguments, okay? The first argument is number one, and the second argument is number two, but the second argument is optional, okay? So let's begin with the first argument, okay, which is cell D2. The second argument is cell D3, and then let's go down the list. 
Okay, now let's end our function by closing out our parentheses, okay, and clicking on or hitting enter on the keyboard, okay? Now, I wanted to show you something. Uh, I wanted to mess something up on purpose just so I could show you. Let's suppose I forgot to close out my function with the uh, closed parentheses. Well, Microsoft Excel automatically closes it for us, okay? It's, it's a useful little feature that it has, okay? But there we have it. We have our total 6,254, okay? But what's an easier way to do this? Instead of having separate arguments for the separate cells, we could actually provide Excel with a cell range, okay? So for the first argument, we're going to select the cell range D2 through D7. Close out our parentheses, click enter, okay? And that's our total. So another way we could do this is by using the auto sum feature, okay? So we could just go over here to this top right corner and click the auto sum button, which is located on the home menu, okay? And then click enter. And that's the same as the function that we just typed in, okay? Now the keyboard shortcut for an auto sum is alt equal, okay? So let's go ahead and try that. Alt equal, and it's the same as an auto sum, all right? Now how does an auto sum work? Well, an auto sum calculates the sum of everything above the cell that you're in up until it, it finds text or a blank cell. In this case, it found some text. Now, before I continue on, I wanted to go over uh, something called the order of operations. So remember in grade school, the old acronym PEMDAS, or please excuse my dear Aunt Sally? Well, Microsoft Excel actually uses that same exact order of operations. So the way it works is everything in parentheses gets calculated first, okay? in Microsoft Excel. All of the exponents get calculated second, multiplication third, division fourth, addition fifth, subtraction sixth. So let's take a look at an example that uses the order of operations, okay? So in column E, we want to calculate our total width tax. So the total width tax is going to be your value in column D multiplied by one plus the sales tax, which in this case is 6% or 0 0.06 as represented by decimal form, okay? So let's go ahead and try that. Now, as you can see, we completely screwed up this formula, okay? All we did was we, take, we took uh, 990, multiplied that by one, which is still 990, and added 0 0.06. So what's the correct way to do this? Well, the correct way to do this is to take the 1 and the H1 and wrap that in parentheses, okay? That way, Excel performs 1 plus H1 first and then multiplies that by D2, okay? And there we have it. That gives us our total with the tax. So let's try copying our formula from cell E2 into cell E3, okay? And right off the bat, I know that this formula is wrong, okay? Because our total is 820. So how can the total with tax still be 820, okay? So when I double click on this formula, what I see is that we're referencing cell H2 when we're supposed to be referencing cell uh, H1, okay? So why is it doing that? It's doing that because we used a relative cell reference, okay? So let's delete this and go back into our original formula, okay? So when we tell Excel 1 plus H1, what we're really telling Excel is we want to take 1 and add whatever value is three columns to the right and one row above the cell that we're in, okay? So when we copy this formula down, it's applying that same concept, okay? Cell H2 is three columns to our right and one row above the cell that we're in, okay? So what we want to use instead of a relative cell reference is an absolute cell reference, okay? So how do we use an absolute cell reference? We use the dollar symbol, okay? So let's go back into our original formula, okay? What we could do 
to lock in cell H1 is put a dollar sign before the H and a dollar sign before the 1, okay? Putting a dollar sign before the column locks in that specific column, and putting a dollar sign before the row locks in that specific row, okay? So technically, we don't even need to put the dollar sign before uh, the H. We just need it for the row, but we'll do it anyways, okay? So now when we copy our formula down, okay, everything should be correct, okay? And when we go into E7, we see that everything is correct and we're still referencing cell H1, okay? Okay, so let's do another auto sum here to get our grand total with tax. Okay, now let's go ahead and change one of these numbers. So let's come over here and change this 68 to 68.01, okay? Now the reason I did that is because I want this to have uh, more than two decimal places. So I could show you a neat little function called the round function. Okay, so suppose I wanted to round this value to two decimal places. Well, I do that by using the round function. Okay, so let's go ahead and initiate the round function. Now, the first argument is the number. Okay, what number do we want to round? Well, we want to round E8. Okay, now let's put a comma. Now it's asking how many digits, how many decimal places do we want to round it to? Okay. So let's put two here because we want to round it to two decimal places as we do with currency. Close our parentheses and there you have it. That's our round function. There's also a built-in function called the random function. And the way the random function works is Microsoft Excel randomly selects a value between zero and one, okay? Now there's also another random function called the rand between function. Okay, and the way the rand between function works is it will automatically uh, return a random integer between whichever integers you uh, enter. Okay, so let's say we want to return a random value between 1 and 10. Okay, first we type 1, followed by a comma, then we type 10. Okay, and it's automatically going to pick a value between 1 and 10. Okay, and it chose 10. But let's go ahead and try again, and you see it changed the value to 2. Now there's also a formula called the mod formula, which is the remainder formula, okay? Now if you remember from early elementary school days what the remainder is, let's say you had uh, 10 divided by 3. Well, the old way we used to do it in elementary school was the answer to 10 divided by 3 is 3 remainder 1, okay? So let's say we wanted to calculate the remainder, okay? The first thing we would do is initiate our formula by typing MOD, open our parentheses, okay? Then our, our number is going to be 10, and our divisor is going to be 3, and that should return 1 because the remainder for 10 divided by 3 is 1. There's also the pi function, which automatically returns pi, okay, accurate to 15 digits. Again, there's no arguments for pi. It doesn't require any. There's also another function called the absolute value function. So suppose that um, we had a negative value for cell E8, okay? So right here we have negative 6,629, okay? Well, what's the absolute value of that? The absolute value is the same thing except there's no negative symbol, okay? So the formula for that is abs, okay, equals a, b, s, and then you have to provide the number that you want to get the absolute value for, okay, which in this case is e14. Okay, so there's also a function called the min function, and the way the min function works is it provides us with the minimum value of a specific range of cells, okay? So... If we want to find the minimum price in this range, that's all we have to do. And the minimum value within that range that we selected is 48, okay? Obviously, the max function is going to be the exact opposite. It's going to provide us with the highest value within that range. There's also a square root function equals SQRT, okay? And let's suppose we wanted to find the square root of 9. 
Okay, we'll just type nine and it should return three. Now these are just basic math functions that Excel has. I wanna get into more complex functions in later videos, okay? So congratulations everyone, you made it to the final video of section one of our Microsoft Excel tutorial. Now, this entire section is dedicated to copying, pasting, and using autofill in Microsoft Excel. These are three very important things that everyone needs to have a pretty good understanding of. So let's go ahead and dive right into it. Okay, so in this example, in column A, we have our part number. In column B, we have the quantity. In column C, we have the price. And in column D, we have our total, okay? And the total is just the quantity times the price. We learned how to copy uh, this formula in the last example, okay, by hitting Control C, selecting the cells that we want to paste the formula to, and then hitting Control V. We also learned how to do an auto sum, okay, and the keyboard shortcut for the auto sum was Alt equal. And that gives us the grand total. Okay, now let's suppose we wanted to copy and paste this grand total from these cells into a different cell. Well, the way we do that is first we highlight the cells that we want to copy. We hit Control C on the keyboard, okay? We come to the cell that we want to copy it into, okay? And then we hit Control V on the keyboard. But wait, what happened? It's showing that the grand total is zero, okay? Now, the reason why the grand total is zero is because we copied the formula from cell D8 into cell H8, okay? And this formula is using a relative cell reference, which we learned about in the previous video. So how do we copy and paste just the values without having to copy and paste the formulas? So first of all, let's undo what we just did. By the way, the keyboard shortcut for undo is Control and Z, okay? So let's hit Control Z, okay? Now this little dashed box that's uh, rotating around the cells that we just copied, that indicates that we just copied these cells, okay? So to get out of that, you just hit the escape button on your keyboard, okay? But let's go back into these cells, okay? And let's hit control C again, okay? Now let's come back into cell G8 and instead of hitting control V on the keyboard, let's right click and now we have a bunch of different paste options. Well, the option that we want to choose is paste values, which is this little clipboard with the numbers one, two, and three on the bottom right-hand corner, okay? That's how we paste just the values. Now, if we go into this grand total, we see that it has the value of 15,435 rather than the formula that was in cell D8, okay? And that's exactly what we want. But you might have also noticed that it didn't copy and paste the format, okay? You see the text in cell C8 is bold and the background in cell D8 is yellow, okay? So let's suppose we wanted to copy and paste the values and the formatting without, co without copying and pasting the formulas. Well, the way we do that is uh, first we highlight the cells that we want to copy. We hit Control C on the keyboard, same as before. We come to the cell that we want to paste it into. We right click, okay, and now there's actually a right arrow here that has more paste options. And the option that we want to choose is this paste uh, values and source formatting, okay? So now we copied and pasted the values and the formatting without copying and pasting the formulas, which is exactly what we wanted to do. You also might have noticed that when I copied and pasted, there was already some, some data in these cells. So when you, when you paste into the cells that already have data, all it does is it pastes over your existing data. Okay, so there's also an option to copy and paste your data, but to transpose your data whenever you paste it, okay? So let's suppose we wanted to copy and paste these part numbers, okay? But we wanted it to display horizontally rather than vertically. Well, the way we do that is we highlight the cells that we want to copy. We hit Control C, same as before. Okay, now let's come to cell G5. Let's right click and then there's an option right here that says transpose for your paste options. That's exactly what we want to do in this case. 
and that's how you transpose data. Okay, so now that you're an expert in copying and pasting, let's talk a little bit about autofill. So what is autofill? Autofill is a tool in Microsoft Excel that can be used to automatically fill in a series of data in your worksheet. This includes dates, numbers, text, and formulas. So how do we use autofill? Well, it's actually pretty easy. Okay, so first of all, let's clear out all of this data that we just copied and pasted, okay? And I like to use this clear all button um, in the top right-hand corner, which clears out um, all of your text, formulas, and your formatting. Let's also get rid of this grand total, and let's get rid of the formulas um, in cells D3 through D7, okay? Now, instead of copying and pasting, we could simply use autofill. So if you hover over the bottom right-hand corner of this cell, you'll see um, this little crosshair pop up, and you could use that crosshair and click and drag it down to the cells that you wanna paste to, okay? and now. Excel pretty much did the copy and paste for us. Now you can also do it without dragging the data. Instead, you could just hover over that bottom right hand corner and double click. So Excel automatically knew uh, to go all the way down the list of parts up until we got to a blank row, okay? Now you might notice that our rows go from row eight to row 10 and row nine is hidden. That's because I hid it on purpose because I wanted to show you guys an example of hiding and unhiding rows. So the way you unhide it is you highlight the two rows that are before and after your hidden rows. Okay, you right click on that row and then you click on unhide and that's how we get our hidden row. Now the reason I added this row is because I wanted to show you an example of what happens when you try to do autofill but there's a blank row in between. Okay, so when I do autofill, it automatically stops at row eight because that's a blank row. Okay, so if you wanted to do autofill all the way through all of your data, but you have some blank rows, you'll need to get rid of those rows. Now, autofill can also be used to predict values. Okay, so what do I mean? Well, let's take a look at this sheet called autofill types. And I have a whole bunch of different examples of how you can use autofill. So in column A, okay, when we drag down this bottom right hand corner, it cycles through every, every single day of the week up until it starts back over at Monday, okay? So Excel was smart enough to know that you were going through all the different days of the week, okay? Um, now, when we use autofill for the date, right now the date is January 1st, 2019. So as we drag it down, uh, it adds a day for each row that we go down. Now, we're using American format for dates where the month comes first and then the day of the month comes second. So it's backwards if you're in Europe, okay? Now, it also recognizes that we're looking at the month of January, okay? So when I use autofill, it automatically cycles through all of the months of the year up until it starts back over at January, okay? And it's even smart enough to know that you're using the abbreviation for January, okay? So when I use autofill, it's gonna use the abbreviations instead. Now, let's suppose we had a date, okay? January 1st, 2019, and then the next date was February 1st, 2019, and for each row that we went down, we wanted to go down a month, okay? Well, look what happens when I try to drag down the bottom right-hand corner. It's adding a day, okay, which is not what we want to do. We want to add a month for every row that we go down. So the way that we do this is we highlight both cells, okay? And now Excel recognizes that we're going down one month for every row that we go down. So now that both cells are highlighted, we drag down this bottom right-hand corner, okay? And Excel is smart enough to add a month, okay, so for every row that we went down. So we have a part number, BRT-1. Look what happens when we use autofill for that. It adds one number after the dash for every row that we go down, okay? Now let's suppose we wanted to add 10, the same thing that we did for the month in column E, we need to highlight both of these cells, okay, and then use autofill. And then as you can see, it adds uh, 10 after the dash for each row that we go down, okay? So autofill is extremely powerful and it could save you a lot of time. Welcome to section two of our Microsoft Excel tutorial. 
This section is basically a crash course on data, okay? Now this is a relatively shorter section when compared to the others, but I still feel like it's extremely important for every Microsoft Excel user to have a good understanding of relational data and to also know all of the terminology related to data. So what is data? Well, that's easy. Data is essentially information. A database is essentially an organized collection of data or an organized collection of information. A database consists of tables and tables consist of records. Now a record can be divided into different fields, okay? And to get a better understanding of this, let's think of a database in the context of a Microsoft Excel workbook. So in this example, this workbook, which is named Data 101, represents a database. And each worksheet within this workbook represents different database tables. Now, if we go back to our first table, we'll notice that in this table, we have nine different records. So think of a record as a row in our table. So as I also mentioned earlier, each record is divided into different fields. Think of fields as our different columns in Microsoft Excel. So in this example, we have six different fields. We have the employee ID, first name, last name, department, location, and hourly rate. Now for our employee ID, each employee ID is going to be unique because it's what's referred to as a unique identifier or primary key, which we're gonna get into in the next video. Okay, so now that you know a little bit about data and the difference between tables, records, and fields, let's talk a little bit about relational data. So what is relational data? Well, it's exactly what it sounds like, data that somehow relates to each other. So in our last video, we finished off by mentioning that the employee ID field for this table contained the primary key for this table. So what is a primary key? A primary key is a unique identifier for a database record. Most of the time, the primary key is a number, but it can also be text or a combination of numbers and text. So what do we mean by a unique identifier? Well, let's look at employee number one, okay? Employee number one is Kenneth Martin, okay? His employee ID is number one, which means that no other employee on this table can have an ID of number one. Sure, you could have another employee with the name Kenneth Martin, but you can't have another employee with an ID of one. Now, let's take a look at column E, which is the location field, okay? So, this first employee, his location is location number one. The second employee's location is location number two. So what is this? This field represents a foreign key. So what is a foreign key? A foreign key is a reference to a primary key in another table. So can you take a guess at which table this foreign key is referencing? You got it. It's referencing the locations table. So the number one for this employee's location represents the Omaha Finance and Accounting Office, okay, in the locations table. This next employee, Sandy, works at location number two, okay? Location number two represents the Miami Marketing Office, okay? And that's how primary and foreign keys work. So in this video, I'm going to talk about formatting cells. Now, formatting cells can mean two different things. On one hand, it has to do with the actual style of a cell. You know, things like font, font color, font size, background color, whether or not you want borders around your cells. All of these things have to do with the actual style of a cell. Now, I'm not gonna cover uh, any of these things because they're all pretty easy to do and they're pretty self-explanatory. Now, on the other hand though, formatting cells also has to do with how Excel displays data from that cell. For instance, how does Excel know what format to display a date as or whether or not you wanted to display a number as currency? All of these things we're gonna cover in this section. So a cell can be one of three different things. It could be a number, it could be text, or it could be a Boolean. Uh, don't worry too much about Booleans now. We'll get into that uh, later on.
Now, if a cell contains a number, that number could be formatted many different ways. It could be formatted as a date. It could be formatted as time, as currency, as a percentage, as a fraction in scientific format. Um, those are just some examples of how a number could be formatted. Now, you may be asking yourself, how can a number be formatted as a date? For instance, let's say we had the number five. How do we convert the number five to a date? Well, by default, the number one represents the date January 1st, 1900 in Microsoft Excel. And the number two represents January 2nd, 1900. So obviously the number five would represent January 5th, 1900. So as of this recording, today's date is May 9th, 2019, okay? And the number that represents today's date is 43,594. So that means that it's been 43,593 days since January 1st, 1900. So now that we have dates covered, let's talk about time. Since the number one represents one day, then the time of the day is represented by a fraction of one. For instance, the time 12 noon represents 12 out of the 24 hours in a day. So noon is expressed by the number 0.5. 6 a.m. represents 6 out of 24 hours of the day. So that's expressed as 0.25. And 6 p.m., okay, that represents 18 out of the 24 hours of the day. So that's expressed by the number 0.75, okay? Now, what if we had the time 6.30 p.m. and we wanted to convert that to a number? Well, that would be expressed as 18.5 out of 24, okay, which is 0.7708333. Okay, but enough of me explaining all of this to you. Let me go ahead and show you an example, okay? So, in the following workbook, which is called Formatting Data, we have a worksheet called Dates and Times, okay? And in cell A2, we have the number 0.5, and we want to convert this number to a time. Well, we already learned that 0.5 represents 12 p.m., so we already know this should give us 12 p.m., but how do we convert this to a time? Well, in the home menu bar, there's this section up here, okay, which is the number format section, okay? And on this drop-down list, we have a bunch of different number formats that we could choose for this cell, okay? Now, we want to select the time, okay? So it returned 12 p.m., okay, which is exactly what we expected. Now, if we apply the same formatting to 0.75, it should give us 6 p.m., which it does, okay? Now, let's suppose we wanted to convert this number 1 to a date. Well, the way that we do that is... We come over here and then we choose the short date. And then we see that it's January 1st, 1900. And then the number two should be January 2nd, 1900. Okay. Now, you can also convert something to a date and time. So 1.5, what should that be? Well, that should, that should represent January 1st, 1900, 12 p.m. Okay. So if we come to this drop down menu, how do we choose a date and time? Well, it's not one of the options available on this drop down, on this drop down list. So let's come over here to, to more number formats. Okay. And now we have, um, under the date category, we have a bunch of different formats that we can convert the date to. And let's choose this one right here, which gives us the date and the time. Okay. Now let's suppose that we wanted to take this number in cell F2 and convert it to a date and time, but we wanted to convert it to a very specific date time format, okay? We wanna convert it to the following format, okay? We want leading zeros, okay, for our month. We want leading zeros for our day, and then we want the full year, okay? And then we want standard time, okay, with seconds being shown, okay? So the way we do that is we Come into this cell, okay, and then from the drop-down list, we select more number formats, and then we come over here to custom, okay, and we go ahead and we type the format that we want. And as you're typing it, you can see a little preview up here.
And that's how you convert it to a very specific date time format, okay? Now, I provided everyone with a cheat sheet in this section that gives us all of the different abbreviations for all the different types of date time formats. So feel free to look at that so you could get a better understanding. But anyways, let's continue on with our example. In cell G2, we have today's date, and we wanna convert this to a number. Well, we already determined that the number for today's date was 43,594. So if we come up here and we select general, we see exactly that. Now let's convert this date time as well uh, by using this general option. We see that it converts it to the same number as G2, but it also has the time as expressed by a fraction. Now I wanted to show you guys something called the format painter, which a lot of you may already be familiar with. The way it works is, let's suppose that we really liked the format in cell F2 um, and we wanted to convert E2 to that same date time format. Well first we select F2, then we come up here and we click on the format painter and then we select the cells that we want to convert to that format, okay? And you can select multiple cells, but I'm just going to select E2. And now you can see E2 is the same exact date time format as F2. But not only does the format painter uh, copy the number format or the date format, but it also copies the style. Okay, so let's say that uh, cell E2 was bold and then we used the format painter and we applied it to F2. Well, now F2 is bold as well. Now I have another worksheet in here, but it's hidden because I wanted to show you how to unhide a worksheet. So if I select the worksheet date and times and then I click on unhide, you see all the hidden worksheets pop up, okay? And let's select this sheet called Other Number Formats. And now this worksheet is no longer hidden, okay? So now I wanted to show you a bunch of different ways of how you can format numbers. So in cell A2, we have the number 0.5, and we want to express this as a fraction. So let's come up here, okay, and let's choose fraction. And now we see it being expressed as a fraction. In cell B2, we have the number 0.25, and we want to express this as a percent. So 0.25 is the same as 25%, and there's actually a shortcut right up here for percent style. Okay, and now we see it being expressed as 25%. In C2, we have the number 3.45, and we want to express this as currency. Well, there's also a shortcut up here for currency, and there we have it. Now in cell D2, we have a number with a bunch of decimal places. And what we want to do is we want to only show two decimal places. So the way we do that is we come up here and there's a shortcut for decrease decimal. And every time you select that, okay, it decreases one decimal place. And to the left of that, we have um, this option for increase decimal. And every time we select this, it increases it one decimal place, okay? So let's go ahead and only show two decimal places. And that's a quick way to do that. Now, there are other ways to only show two decimal places, and I'll show you that later on, okay? Now, in cell E2, we have the number negative 38.3. And what we want to do is we want negative numbers to have parentheses around them, which is very common in accounting. Well, one way we could do this is we can come up here and choose this comma style option. And the comma style automatically puts parentheses around negative numbers. Now there's also another way to do this, which I'll show you next, okay? Now in cell F2, we have this very large number and we wanna express it with commas. So a quick way to do that is to choose that same comma style option, okay? But if you notice, it automatically adds two decimal places to the end of this number. Well, what if we didn't want those decimal places? Well, what we could do is we can come up here, okay, to this drop down menu and choose more number formats. And let's come over here to number. And now we see, okay, decimal places two. Let's change that to zero, okay? And now we see that it's using a 1000 separator, which is the comma, which is exactly what we wanted. So let's keep that selected. And now, in this part, it's asking us how do we want to display our negative numbers, okay? The first option is to actually have a negative sign and for it to be black. The second option is no negative sign and red. The third option is parentheses around the number. And the fourth option is parentheses around the number and red, 
Okay, so let's stick with the default. It doesn't even matter for this one because this number is not even negative. Now, let's copy this format into G2, okay? And now this number is being expressed with commas without the decimal places as well. And that's exactly what we want. Now, I wanted to cover one more thing. Let's suppose that in E2, we wanted the negative numbers to be in parentheses, which it already is, but we also wanted it to be read whenever there's a negative number. So let's come back up here to more number formats. Let's choose number, okay? And now let's choose this last option here. And now it's showing as read as well as within parentheses. So let's suppose we had more data in the rest of these cells. As you can see, the format in cells E3 and E4 is totally different than the format in E2. Well, why is that? This is because we never applied the format in E2 to the rest of these cells, okay? So a quick way to apply it to the rest of the cells in column E is to select E2, okay, choose the format painter, and then click on the column. And now the rest of the column is the format that we want it to be. So if we come into E5 and we type up another number, another negative number, we'll see that it's formatted the way we want it to be formatted. Okay, and these are just a few examples of how you can format numbers. Okay, now this video is all about conditional formatting and conditional formatting is mainly a visual tool. Okay, let's say you had a group of students and you had all their grades in one column and you wanted those grades to be color coded. For instance, every grade that was from a 90 to a 100, you wanted that to be green. And then every grade from an 80 to an 89, you wanted blue and you know, so on down the list. All, the, all of the Fs, you know, 59 and below, you want those to be red. Well, the way you would do that would be by using conditional formatting. So let's go ahead and take a look. Okay, so here we have a list of a bunch of different students, okay? And for this, for this particular class, these students took three tests and there is a possible 300 points for, for all three of these tests, okay? So their grade is their total points divided by the total points possible. Okay, so that's their grades in column G. So first of all, let's put this student list in alphabetical order. Okay, so let's come over here to the data tab and let's click on the sort A through Z button. Okay, now what we wanna do is um, let's express column G as a percent. Okay, so let's come to the home uh, tab and let's click on this little percent sign right here. Okay, now it's being expressed as a percent, but let's go ahead and add a couple of decim decimal places to the percent. Okay, so let's click on this button right here, increase decimal, and let's show two different decimal places, okay? Now, I don't like how wide uh, column F is because of cell F1. And uh, I forgot to show you earlier, but I'm gonna show you now the, this wrap text feature. So if I come up here, okay, and click on this wrap text button. Now, if I make this column more narrow, you don't see it right now, but the text points is now below the word possible. Okay, so if I wanna show that, let me come over here to between rows one and two and double click. Okay, now you see possible points, it's being wrapped, okay? And that's the wrap text feature. So let me double click on this to resize it. Okay, and now that, that looks a lot better, okay? And now we wanna start doing some conditional formatting. So the first kind of conditional formatting that I wanna show you is color scales. And it's pretty easy to do. So let's highlight column G, okay? Let's come over here to conditional formatting, which is under the home tab, okay? and let's go to color scales and let's choose this first one. So the way this color scale works is the higher the grade on this list, the more green the background's gonna be. And the lower the grade, like for this 50% here, the more red the background's gonna be. And you know, like the 86, that's a green, but it's a lighter green. And kind of the ones in the middle are like a yellow or like an orangish. So this is a really quick and easy way to do a color scale, and it's something that I use all the time. Now there's a bunch of other default color scales that you can use, so if you highlight column G and you come back to conditional formatting and color scales, 
as you hover over each of these different color scales, you get a preview And you can also customize your color scale. So if you come over here to more rules, okay, now you can put your settings as to how you want your color scale to be applied. And this is all pretty self-explanatory, so I'm not going to walk you through it, but uh, feel free to mess around with it. But I like to stick with the main green, yellow, red color scale. So let's click cancel. Okay, now let's suppose that we have test one, test two, and test three, and we wanted to highlight every single test that was below a 60. So 59 and below, we want those to be highlighted red just so we could kind of visually see all of the bad test scores. Well, a way we could do that is if we highlight all of these columns here, okay, which I already did, and then we come here to conditional formatting, right? And now we come to highlight cell rules, okay? And we want to highlight all the cells that are less than. So let's click here on less than. Okay. And we want we want to format cells that are less than. And right now it's set at a 72. But let's set it for a 60. So anything less than a 60 is going to be highlighted. Okay. And what do we want to highlight it with? We want to highlight it with light red fill with dark red text. Okay. We could also come here to custom format if we don't want any of these um, default ones but let's stick with the light red fill with dark red text okay and let's click OK and now we see all of the uh, bad test scores being highlighted but there's something else that I wanted to point out when we when we told Microsoft Excel that we want to highlight all of the cells with a value of less than 60 it ended up highlighting all of the blank cells okay so let's try to work around this okay so let's highlight columns B through D again and let's create a new rule okay so we click on conditional formatting here and let's choose this new rule option and let's for the rule type select this rule type right here format only cells that contain and now where it's asking format only cells with let's choose blanks okay and now let's click on OK but it's still formatting these cells with that same red color. There's something else that we need to do. So let's come back to conditional formatting and let's click on manage rules. Okay. And now we see this, this rule that we just created. But what we need to do is we need to click on this checkbox that says stop if true. And now let's click on OK. And now our conditional formatting is being applied correctly. Now let's also suppose that we wanted all of the A grades, so a 90 and above, we wanted that to be green. So let's go ahead and do some conditional formatting. So we have columns B through D highlighted. Now let's come up here to conditional formatting. Let's go to highlight cell rules, okay, and then let's choose greater than. And right now um, it's set at 72, but let's change that to an 89. So we want anything greater than an 89, okay? And what do we want to format it with? We want to format it with green fill with dark green text, okay? Okay, and now all of the A grades are being highlighted green. Now you might notice that the test scores for some crazy reason are also being highlighted with that same green color so let's fix that so first of all let's highlight columns B through D okay let's come back to conditional formatting and let's come here to new rule okay and now let's say format only cells that contain but let's put specific text and for that specific text let's put test okay because all of these headers have the text test in it okay and now for the for the format let's leave it as blank and let's click OK but it's still green so there's one more thing that we have to do let's come back to conditional formatting let's go to manage rules and let's check this box right here where it says stop if true same way as we did before now let's click apply and OK and now everything is how we want it to be now let's suppose there's one more rule that we want to apply. We want all of the B's, so from an 80 to an 89, 
we want all of those cells to have a blue background. So let's re-highlight columns B through D. Let's come to conditional formatting. Let's choose highlight cell rules. And now we want to choose between. And we want our lower value to be 80 and our upper value to be an 89. And what do we want to format it with? Well, we don't want any of these default options. So let's come over here to custom format. And now let's choose the fill option. And now let's select this blue color right here. Let's click OK and let's click OK. And now you see that formatting being applied to all of the B grades. But let's suppose that we don't like that formatting. We think that the, the background is too dark and the red text is, is no good. So let's, let's come back to conditional formatting and let's click on manage rules. And now we see that rule that we just created. Let's double click on that and let's come back to this option right here where it says format and let's choose a lighter blue color and under font let's choose black instead of that that red color now let's click OK OK and OK one more time and now it's being formatted how we want it to now let's talk a little bit about data validation now I'm gonna try to keep this section short and sweet because honestly I feel like data validation is a little bit overrated um, it's not really something that I use that often, but that being said, you should still understand what it is and how it works and how to use it. And who knows, you might end up using it more than I do. Okay, so here we have a list of employees, okay? This is under the data validation file on the employees tab. Okay, but anyways, let's suppose that Sandy is our secretary and one of Sandy's duties is to update this spreadsheet every time that we hire a new employee. But we want to make sure that Sandy is entering all of this information in correctly. For instance, we want to make sure that when she puts in an employee ID, that the employee ID is a positive whole number. We want to make sure that the first and last names, you know, don't exceed a certain amount of characters. Also, we want to make sure that Sandy only enters valid department names. That way she doesn't misspell it or enter a department that doesn't even exist. Um, so we could use data validation for that. And, you know, let's suppose that minimum wage was $8.25. Um, we could use data validation to make sure that she doesn't enter an hourly rate below $8.25. And you could even use data validation for dates. You know, let's suppose that the business opened on January 6th. 2016. Well, you can use data validation to make sure that Sandy can't enter a date before that. Okay, so let's start off with the higher date. Now, the way that it works is whatever cells you have selected, that's what the data validation is going to be applied to. Now, I usually like to select the entire column, okay? This ensures that, you know, no matter how many records we add, that the data validation is still going to be intact. So if you go to the data tab, there's this little icon, okay? If you hover over it, you'll see data validation. Okay, so let's click on data validation. Now it's asking us the validation criteria, okay? So we want the criteria to be a date, and we wanna make sure the date is between January 6, 2016, which we said was the start date. And then for the end date, we could just put some arbitrary time in the future. And then let's click OK. So now if I try to enter some text here, I get an error message. If I try to enter an earlier date, I also get an error message, okay? But if I enter a valid date, it works for me. Now let's say we don't like this default error message, okay? Well, we can change that. If you re-highlight the column, come back into data validation, under the tab error alert, there's an option to change your error message. Okay, and now we see that error message. You can also add an input message and I'll show you how that works. Okay, so let's highlight column F. Let's come over here to data validation and let's go to input message. And let's put a little tip here. Okay, so now every time that you select a cell, you see that little tip pop up. 
Okay, now let's do some data validation for column E. Okay, so we want to choose a decimal, not a whole number, a decimal. And we want to make sure that it's greater than 825, which we said was the minimum wage. So now, if we want to be cheap and pay the employee $5 an hour, we see this error message pop up, okay? But if we select a valid uh, hourly rate, it goes through for us. Okay, now column D we're going to get to later on, but let's look at columns B and C, okay? Now, we could actually highlight both of these columns because we want the same data validation rules to apply to both, okay? So if we come to data validation, let's select text length, and we want to make sure that it's between 1 and 50 characters, okay? Now, if we try to enter a name that's over 50 characters, we get an error message, okay? But let's try a valid name. And it works for us, okay? Okay, and what did we say about column A? We said that we wanted it to be a positive whole number. So let's come up here to data validation, okay? And now let's choose whole number, and we want it to be between 1 and and 1 million, let's say. So if I try to enter a zero, or let's say 2 million, I get an error message, okay? But if I enter 10, then it works for me. Okay, now for column D, we want to make sure that we're only entering valid department names. So the first thing we need to do is make a list of all the different department names. Okay, so first, let's copy this onto sheet 2. Okay, and now we have our list, but we, we have duplicate records, as you can see. So I want to show you something called the Remove Duplicates tool. So first, we select the column. We come up here, and it's actually right next to the Data Validation button. Uh, it might be a little bit different on your version of Excel, but here it is, the Remove Duplicates button. And if we select it and we hit OK, we get rid of all the duplicate records. Okay, so now that we have the list of different departments, let's go back into our Employees Worksheet. Okay, now let's highlight column D and click on data validation. Now for the validation criteria, we want to select list, okay? And now it's asking us for the source data. Well, if we, if we select this little icon right here, it allows us to select the, the source data, okay? So let's select uh, cells A2 through A7. And if we click enter and click enter one more time, Okay, now the data validation is being applied to this column. So if we come into cell D12 here, okay, now we could choose from a list of all of the different departments. However, if you wanted to add another department, okay, so let's add a um, logistics department. Now, if we come back here into this drop down list, we don't see that new department, the logistics department, because we only selected cells A2 through A7 under our data validation criteria. Okay, so we'll have to go in and change that. Let's change that to A8. So now when we come back here, we see the logistics department. Now. There is kind of a, a workaround for this. There's actually many different workarounds, but I'm going to show you one of them, okay? Instead of adding the um, department to the bottom of this list, add it to the middle. So come up to row 5 and click Insert, and now it inserts a row. So if we put a new department name, let's call this Shipping. That should do the trick. And there you see it, shipping. So another thing you might have noticed is that this list is not in alphabetical order, okay? So in order to put this in alphabetical order, we'll have to change the actual source list, okay? So let's come back to the list, and let's click on cell A2, and then let's click this little sort button right here, sort A to Z, and this is also on the data validation tab. And that puts everything in alphabetical order. So now when we come back to the Employees tab, 
okay, and we click on this drop down list, it's, it's also in alphabetical order. Okay, so this section is all about cleaning data. Now, a lot of the time, we work with very, very large amounts of data that come from various different sources. It could come from another spreadsheet that comes from a coworker. It could come from a bank statement, from QuickBooks, from different point of sale systems, or maybe even straight from the web. And on many instances, this data needs to be cleaned up so what do I mean by cleaned up? Well, it can mean a number of different things. Maybe the dates are in the wrong format. Maybe all the data is in one column and it needs to be separated into different columns. Perhaps the numbers are in a text format, but they need to be converted to numbers. Uh, maybe there's certain characters that need to be removed from text. Maybe certain text needs to be combined with other text. Like if you have someone's first name and last name, maybe you wanna combine them. So Microsoft Excel provides us with a number of different tools and functions that allow us to easily clean up data, okay? So you could get the data into the exact format that you need it to be in by using these tools. So first, let's go over the text to columns tool. So here we have a worksheet called NFL Weekly Data, and this is in the Text to Columns workbook, okay? And in this worksheet, we have a bunch of fantasy football stats. And just to give you a little bit of background, okay, I do a lot of work with sports analytics. And on every Monday during the NFL football season, I pull this information from a web page, but when I pull it from the web page, it's in this weird funky format where everything is in one column. But if you look closer, you'll realize that there's actually multiple fields in this data set. And each of these fields is separated by semicolons. So what we want to do is we want to separate this into different columns. And in order to do that, we're going to use the text to columns feature. Okay. So first thing we need to do is we need to highlight column A. Okay. Then we need to come up here to the data tab and we need to click on text to columns. And now it's asking us to choose the file type that best describes your data. We want to keep it on delimited. So let's click on next. Okay. And now here under delimiters, let's select semicolon and let's uncheck tab. Okay. And now you see a little data preview here on the bottom and you're seeing now that it's separating it into separate columns. Okay. And that's all we need to do now. So we could click on finish. And now everything is separated into separate columns, okay, which is exactly what we wanted to do. So now that everything is in separate columns, I want to show you the filter feature. So first of all, what is data filtering? Data filtering is the process of choosing a smaller part of your data set and using that subset for viewing or analysis. So in this example, we have a bunch of fantasy football scores for every player in the NFL for a particular week. So in column A, we have the player name. In column B, we have that player's position. So in this first example, his position is QB, which means quarterback. In column C, we have the team that this player plays for. So in this first example, Patrick Mahomes plays for KAN, which is the Kansas City Chiefs. In column D, we have the opponent. Okay, so this is who this player went up against. Uh, in this particular example, he went up against the Oakland Raiders. In column E, we have home slash away. So this means was this player at home or was he away? Um, in this example, he was at home. That's what the H stands for. In column F, we have the salary. Okay, that's a fantasy football thing. Don't worry too much about that right now. In column G, we have the points. Okay, this is how many fantasy points this player scored, okay, in this particular game. And in column H, we have the date. Now, you might notice that this date is in some weird format where the year is first, and then there's a space, and then there's the month, and a dash, and then the day. So we'll fix that later on um, with some of the things that we learned in this section. But anyways, back to data filtering. So let's suppose that we wanted to filter this data so that we're only looking at quarterbacks. Well, we're going to do this by using a data filter. So first, let's make these headers bold. Okay, control B is the shortcut. Okay, and now let's apply a filter. So in order to apply a filter, click on any cell in your data set. Okay, and you come up here to data. 
and then you click the filter button and that turns your filter on and then you could you could select it again to turn off your filter by the way the keyboard shortcut for this is control shift l so let's type control shift l that turns the filter on and then we could type control shift l again and that turns it off but i wanted to point something out if you have any blank rows in your data set well your filter is going to stop right there okay so if i try to apply a filter to this data what you see is that it stops right where there's a blank row. So in order to work around this, first let's turn off our filter. And now we need to highlight our entire data set. Okay, so let's come all the way to the bottom of this data set and make sure everything's selected. And now let's choose filter. And now, as you can see, our entire data set is ready to be filtered. So what did we say we wanted to do? We said that we only wanted to see quarterbacks, okay? So we need to apply a filter to column B. Let me expand that. Okay, so let's select this little option right here and let's deselect all, okay? And now let's choose this QB option. Let's put a check mark right there. And now, as you can see, our entire data set is being filtered and the only records we can see are the records that have QB as their position. Now let's suppose we only wanted to view quarterbacks who scored over 20 points in column G. Okay, so let's keep the existing filter on and let's come over here to column G. Okay, let's click on this option and now let's go to this part that says number filters and let's choose greater than or equal to and let's, let's type in here 20. So now it's only showing all the quarterbacks who scored more than 20 points. Now, if we wanted to unfilter this data so that we can see the entire data set again, um, first we could come up here, okay, and we could click on select all again, and that turns off our filter for column G. But now we still have the filter on for column B. Okay, so we need to come over here and we need to select all for this one as well. And now there's no longer a filter on all of our data. Okay, now let's suppose we only wanted to see running backs who scored more than 20 points, okay? So let's come over here to position. Let's deselect all, okay? And let's choose RB. And now let's come over here to column G, number filters, and then let's put greater than or equal to 20. And now you can see there's a, a much smaller subset of data for running backs who scored more than 20 points. Now there's another way we can unfilter this data and that's to come up here, okay, by the filter button and click this clear button and that clears out all of the existing filters. Now you can basically filter for any criteria you can think of. So let's say we only wanted to, for some reason, see guys named Mike. Well, let's come over here to text filters and then let's come down here to contains okay and then let's put Mike and as you can see it's being filtered for guys with the name Mike and that's how you filter data in Microsoft Excel okay now this video is all about concatenation now I know it sounds like a big fancy word but concatenation is actually a pretty simple concept so what is concatenation Concatenation is the process of joining two or more text strings together into one text string. Okay, so here we have a bunch of names and addresses. This is in the concatenation file. And in column G, what we want to do is we want to combine the first name and the last name. Well, we're going to do this by using the concatenation function. So let's begin typing the function. And now you see it pop up right here. So let's choose this first one, concat. And now it's asking us for the first text string. Well, the first text string is going to be the first name, okay? And now let's type a comma, and now it's asking us for the second text string. So that's going to be the last name. Now let's close our parentheses and let's see what happens. So as you can see, it combined the first name and the last name, but there's no space between the two uh, text strings. So let's come back into our formula and right after A2, we're going to want to put a space. So that space needs to be in quotations, okay? And then let's put another comma. And now let's hit enter. 
and now we see that it's putting a space between the first name and the last name. Now there's also another way to do concatenation without using the concat formula. So let's come back into G2, let's clear out the formula, let's type up a new formula. And instead of using the concat formula, we're going to use ampersands, and I'll show you how it works. So let's select A2, followed by an ampersand, followed by the space, which is in quotations, followed by another ampersand, and then let's choose the last name. Let's hit enter, and that's pretty much the same exact thing as using the concatenation formula. Okay, so let's do an autofill to copy these formulas down, and let's auto size this column. Okay, now let's come into cell H2 over here, and what do we want to do for H2? Well, we want to concatenate the address, city, state, and zip. That way we get the full address, okay? So we're going to use the concatenation function for this. Now the first text string is going to be the address. The second text string is going to be a comma followed by a space because we want a comma and a space after the street address, okay? Now the third text string is going to be the city followed by another comma and space followed by the state followed by just a space, okay? We don't want a comma after the, the state, we just want a space, okay? And then we're gonna, we're gonna add the zip. Let's close our parentheses, and if I did this correctly, this should work out. And it did, okay? As you can see, we have a comma and a space after the street address, and then we have another comma and a space after the city name. So let's copy this formula down and expand this column and now we can see we have the full address in column H. But there's one more thing that I want to show you. Let's suppose that we didn't want all of this information on one single line. Let's suppose that we wanted a line break right after the street address, okay? Well, we're going to use a char 10 in order to do this. So let's come back into this formula and let's get rid of this comma followed by a space and let's replace this with a char 10. And a char 10 is basically a line break. Now let's click enter. Now there's still not a line break because we need to use a wrap text on this in order to see the line break. So let's come up here to wrap text and now you can see that the street address and the, and the city, state, and zip are on separate lines, okay? So let's copy this formula down and now you can see that it's being applied correctly for all of these other addresses. So you see, concatenation sounds like a fancy word, but it's pretty easy. In this video, I'm gonna go over five different functions in Excel. The left, right, mid, find, and lend functions. These are five very important functions that I use all the time. They allow us to extract a smaller substring of text from a larger string of text. So let's take a look. So here we have a bunch of phone numbers. This is in the phone numbers worksheet in the file named left, right, mid, find, len. And I apologize for my unoriginal file names. So let's come over here into cell B2. What do we want to do in B2? We want to extract the area code from A2, okay? And the area code is the first three digits of the phone number. So in order to do that, we're going to use the left function. So let's begin by typing up the left function. And now the first argument is the text. What text are we referring to? Well, we're referring to cell A2. And now how many characters from the left do we want to extract? So that's going to be three. So let's come and copy this formula down, and now we have all of our area codes in column B. Now I'm going to show you the write function. So let's come over here to the city state zip worksheet. So in cell C2, we want to extract the zip code from B2. Well, the zip code is always going to be the last five characters of this text string. So we're going to use a write function. So let's come over here and let's begin by typing our write function. And now the text that we're referring to is cell B2 and the number of characters is going to be five because there's always five digits in an area code. 
So let's close our parentheses and let's hit enter. And now we have our zip code. So with the left function, you're extracting characters from the left side of the string. With the right function, you're extracting characters from the right side of the string. So obviously now, with the mid function, we're going to be extracting characters from the middle of the string. So let's go back into the worksheet called phone numbers, okay? Now let's suppose for some reason that we wanted to extract the middle three numbers within this phone number. Well, in order to do that, we're going to use the mid function. So let's come over here into cell C1 and let's create a header. And let's use the format painter to copy the format from B1. Now let's come into C2 and let's initiate our mid function. Now the first thing that it's asking us for is the text, so that's going to be A2. Now it's asking us for the start number. So in this particular case, the start number is going to be 5. Okay, why is it 5? Well, the number that we want to start from is 5 characters into this string because the first 4 characters of this string are the area code followed by the dash. So the start number is going to be 5. And now the number of characters is going to be 3 because it's asking us how many characters from this point do we want to extract, okay? Now let's close our parentheses and now you can see that it's extracting the middle three numbers which is 861. So let's copy this formula down and also let's use a format painter. And that's how you use the mid function. Now let's look at the find function. So let's come back into the city state zip worksheet. Now let's take a look at cell B2. Let's suppose we wanted to figure out how many characters into this text string the comma appears. Well we can do that by using the find function and I'll show you what, what the whole point of even doing that is uh, later on in this video. But let's come over here into D1 and let's type up our header. Let's use a format painter as well. Okay, now let's come over here into D2 and let's initiate our find function. Okay, now it's asking us what text do we want to find, okay? Well, we want to find the comma. So let's put the commas in quotes. Now it's asking us within text, within what text do we want to find the comma? Well, that's going to be cell B2. And now the start number is optional. It's saying at what point of this uh, text do you want to start this function? But we could leave that blank. And now, as you can see, the comma appears 13 characters into this text string. So let's come over here and copy the formula down. And also, let's use a format painter to give it that blue background. Okay, now what the hell was the whole point of doing that? Well, let's suppose that we wanted to extract the city name from this entire text string. Well, we know that the city name is everything that's left of the comma. So we can combine a left function with a find function in order to extract the city name. So let's come over here into E1. Let's type up a header. Let's use the format painter. And now let's come into E2 and initiate our left function. Now it's asking us for the text. Okay, so the text is going to be cell B2. Now from how many characters to the left of this text string do we want to extract? Well, we want to extract everything that's left of the comma. And we know that the comma in this uh, case is 13 characters into this text. So let's choose D2 for the number of characters. Now let's close out our parentheses. Now something's going to be wrong, watch. As you can see, it extracted not only the city name, but also the comma. So let's go back into our formula, and now where it says the number of characters, okay, let's say D2 minus 1, okay, and let's copy this formula down, and now we have all of the city names in column E. But now we have this column D in here, which looks kind of funny. So let's get rid of this. But wait, look what happens when we got rid of this. Now this formula is trying to reference a cell that doesn't even exist anymore. Okay, so let's get rid of these formulas. And now what we're going to do is we're going to do a nested function. We're going to do a find function 
within a left function. So, so let me show you how this works. So now it's asking us for the text. That's still going to be B2. But for the number of characters, for that, we're going to use the find function, okay? So what text do we want to find? We want to find the comma, okay? And now it's asking us within text. Within what text do we want to find the comma? Well, that's going to be B2 still. And now let's close out our parentheses. But that's going to give us the number of characters where the comma starts. So we need to subtract one from that, okay? Now let's close out our left function. So let's copy this formula down to get all of the different city names. And that takes me to our last function of this video, which is the len function. So you can use the len function to tell you how many characters are in a specific string. So let's come over here into our worksheet called part number. Now in cell A2, we have a part number. Let's suppose that in cell B2, we wanted to figure out how many characters were, were in this part number. Okay, so let's type up the len function. Okay, and now it's asking us for the text. So that's going to be cell A2. And let's close our function. And that's pretty much it. So now this is telling us that there's nine characters in cell A2. Now, if you notice, all of these part numbers have the characters dash FTR at the end of them. So let's suppose that we wanted to strip these characters out. Well, the way we would do that is we would use a left function in combination with the len function. So, so let me show you how this works. So let's come back into B2 and let's clear out the formula and let's initiate our left function. Now the text is going to be cell A2. Now it's asking us for the number of characters. Well, the number of characters is going to be the entire length of cell A2 minus 4. So let's type up our len function, okay? And now the text that we're referring to is cell A2. We close out of our len function, and now we're going to say minus 4. Let's close out our parentheses, and now we have the part number without the dash FTR. So let's copy this formula down, and now we have successfully implemented a nested left and len function. Okay, now I want to go over the substitute and replace functions, okay? So let's take a look at cell A2. Let's suppose that in this skew, okay, a skew is another word for like a part number. And let's suppose for some reason we wanted to replace the dashes with an asterisk, okay? Well, we can use the substitute formula in order to do this. So let's go over here into cell B2. And let's begin by typing the substitute function. And now you see it pops up, okay? Now, the first argument is the text. What text are we referring to? That's going to be A2. Now, what's the old text? The old text is going to be the dash, okay? That's what we want to get rid of. And now the new text, well, that's going to be an asterisk because we want to replace the dashes with asterisks. Okay, and now the instance number, that's an, an optional argument. I'll get, I'll get into that next, but we can close out this function and it should work. And as you can see, it did work. It replaced the dashes with asterisks. Okay, so I mentioned the instance number. Let's suppose for some reason that we only wanted to replace the second dash. So let's come into cell B2 and let's type up our substitute function, okay? And it's going to be the same as before, except now for the instance number, we only want to replace the second instance of the dash. We don't want to replace the first instance of the dash. So we're going to type a two here. Now let's close out of our parentheses. And as you can see, it only changed the second instance of the dash into an asterisk, which is, which is exactly what we wanted it to do. But let's get rid of that and let's just keep the original function. Okay, let's do an autofill to copy that down. And now let's come over here into, into cell C2 and let's do a replace function. Now a replace function works a little bit differently than a substitute function. Okay, so let's suppose that the first three characters, okay, these first three letters, we didn't need those and we wanted to replace that with the letters RXL for ready Excel, of course. Well, let's, let's do a replace function for that. So let's begin by typing up the replace function. 
okay? And now it's asking us for the old text. That's going to be A2. Now it's asking us for the start number. So at what point do we want to start replacing text? Well, we want to replace the very beginning, okay, the first three letters. So we're going to say for start number, we're going to say 1. And now the number of characters, how many of those characters do we want to replace? Well, we're going to say 3, okay, because we want to replace the first three characters. And now the new text means what do we want to replace it with? So we're going to say RXL here. Let's close out of our function. And now, as you can see, it replaced the first three characters with RXL. So let's do an autofill. Now let's come over here into D2, and let's suppose that we didn't want to replace the first three characters. We wanted to replace the, the middle three numbers here. Well, we can use a replace formula for that as well. So let's come and let's type up our replace function. Okay, now the old text is going to be A2. Now this time the start number is going to be 5 because the middle three digits here, they start at the fifth character. So let's type 5. Now how many of those characters from this point do we want to replace? Well, we want to replace 3. And now the new text is going to be RXL. Now let's close out of our function. Now there we have it. It replaced the middle three numbers with the characters RXL. So let's do an autofill. And that's how you do substitute and replace formulas. Okay, so in this video, I'm going to go over three very simple functions. The upper, lower, and proper functions. So, in cell A2, we have some text here. And let's suppose that we want all of this text to be uppercase. Well, we can do that by using the upper function. So let's come over here into B2 and let's type up upper and now the function pops up let's click on it and now it's asking for the text well that's going to be cell a2 let's close out the text and now everything is uppercase now the lower function works the same exact way as the upper function except it makes everything lowercase so let's go ahead and type up lower okay and now the text same thing a2 and now everything is lowercase now, the proper function, the way this works is it makes the first letter of every word uppercase and the rest lowercase, okay? So here we have a name right here, Paul Johnson. The J in Johnson is not uppercase, but then there's an uppercase H right here. You know, this could be a typo or something like that. So let's come into E2 and let's type up proper. And now let's refer to cell D2. And now the name Paul Johnson is being capitalized correctly. So now we're going to take everything that we just learned in this section and use it in order to clean up a large set of data. Let's take a look at the NFL Weekly Data Worksheet in the All Together file. So you may remember this data set from the filter video, but there's a couple of things that are wrong with this data. First of all, the player's name is in an incorrect format. It has it with the, the player's last name first, followed by a comma, followed by his first name. And we'll need to change that into a normal format. Second of all, the team and opponent, those, those abbreviations for the different teams are all lowercase, but we need it to be uppercase. And lastly, the date is in this weird format that I talked about earlier. And it's actually not a, a recognized date by Microsoft Excel. So I'll show you how to get that into a recognizable date format. So first of all, let's copy these headers directly to the right of this data set. Now, I already did that, and I have it hidden here, so let me unhide that. So in cell I2, we want the player's full name. However, if you look in cell A2... Okay, you'll see that it's currently in the format last name, comma, first name. But we want it to be in the format first name, space, last name, followed by any suffixes. Like, for instance, this guy is the second. So that suffix will also go on the end. Well, in order to do that, we're going to need to use some of the formulas that we just learned. So the first thing that we're going to need to do is we're going to need to extract just the first name. 
Well, in order to extract just the first name, we're going to have to use a mid function. So let's begin by typing the function. Now it's asking for the text. So the text is going to be A2. Now it's asking for the start number. Well, for the start number, we want to find the comma, okay? So let's do a find function. So now it's asking what text does it want us to find? Well, we want to find the comma. And we can even put a space in there too because there's always a space after the comma. It doesn't make a difference. Okay, now it's asking within what text? So that's going to be cell A2. Okay, and now we close out the function. That's the start number as to where the comma starts. But the actual first name isn't going to start until two characters after that because you, got a, you have a comma and then a space. So we need to add two to this. Okay, and now it's finally asking us number of characters. Well, for this, we could just put like a hundred, okay? That way we, we make sure that it covers enough to cover the person's full name. And let's close out of the mid function. And if I did this correctly, we should have successfully extracted the player's first name. And we did. You can see Patrick. But we're not done. We still need to extract the player's last name. So let's come back into I2. And let's do a concatenation by using the ampersand, which we learned about earlier. So now we want to extract the last name. Well, how are we going to do that? We're going to extract all the text that's left of the comma. So let's do a left function. Okay, now the text is going to be A2. And the number of characters, we're going to use the find function for that. Now it's asking what text do we want to find? Well, we want to find the comma and the space. It doesn't make a difference. Within what text? Well, within A2. Okay, and then that last argument is optional. So we could close out the find function. And now we want to subtract one from this because if we don't, then it's going to include the comma. And let's close out the function. And if I did this correctly, it should be showing the player's first name and last name. And it did, but we're going to also have to add a space, okay, between the first name and the last name. So let's come right over here to after the first name. Let's add another ampersand, and let's put a, a space within quotations. And let's hit enter. And now we have the first name followed by the last name. Now for the position, we don't have to do anything to that. So let's just reference cell B2 with a simple formula. But for the team and opponent, we said that we wanted that to be uppercase. So let's use the upper formula. Okay, and now the text we're referring to is cell C2. And let's close out the function. Now I want to show you something. We can use the autofill to drag this over to the right. And since we're using a relative cell reference, which we learned about in a previous section, Excel knew to reference the cell that's one column to the right. Now for the home salary and points per game cells, we don't need to do anything for them. So we could just reference those cells directly. And we can do an autofill for these as well. Now for the date, we want it to be in the following format. So if you come into cell H2, you'll notice the year comes first, followed by a space, followed by the month, and then a dash, and then the day of the month. So we're gonna have to get creative. Now, the 12-30, that's actually already in the format that we need. So we need to extract just that part of the text string. Well, how can we do that? We know that that part of the text string always comes after the space. So let's come over here into cell P2 and let's initiate a mid function. Now it's asking us for the text. That's going to be cell H2. Now it's asking us for the start number. Well, the start number is going to be one character after the space. So let's use a find function to find where that space occurs. So let's type up the find function and now find what text. Well, we want to find the space. Now it's asking us within what text. Well, it's going to be cell H2. Let's close out of the function. Okay, but we also want to add one to that because we want to begin one character after the space. 
And for the number of characters, we could just put 10 here. And now we have the month followed by the day of the month. But we also need to add the year. So let's come back into this formula. Okay. Let's come up here to the formula bar. And let's add an ampersand in order to concatenate the year. And now we want to extract the year. Well, the year is all, always going to be the first four characters. So let's use a left function. What text are we referring to? Cell H2. And for the number of characters, it's going to be four. Okay. And now we have the month followed by the day of the month followed by the year. Now we also need to add a dash after the day of the month. So let's come back here into this formula. Let's add the dash and let's add another ampersand. And now we have the date in the format that we need it to be. Now I wanted to point something out though. If we come up here and expand this column, we see that this date is aligned to the left of the column. That means that Excel still recognizes this as text. So we want Excel to recognize this as an actual date. Well, a little trick that I've learned that allows Excel to recognize this as an actual date, if we come up here into the formula bar and we wrap this entire formula in, a par in parentheses and then we multiply that by one, now you can see Excel is recognizing this as a number. And if you remember from our earlier videos, this number actually represents a date. So if we come up here, okay, and we change the format to short date, you'll see the date that that number represents. Now let's do an autofill to copy down all of these formulas. Now we have nice, clean data that we can work with. And the benefit of doing that is now if I wanted to, I could copy this weekly data into the yearly data worksheet. Okay, so let's hit control C. Let's come into the yearly data worksheet. Let's come to the bottom of the data set by hitting control and then the down arrow. Okay, let's go down one more cell and let's do a paste special values here. Okay. And now we added the weekly data to the yearly data and everything is consistent. And one of the benefits of fixing that date is now if we wanted to, we could filter by date. So let's come up to the top. Okay, let's do a filter by hitting Control Shift L. And if you come over to the date column, you'll see that it recognizes the date. So if you wanted to, you could filter by year, you could you can uh, filter by month, or you can even filter by the day. And that's the benefit of cleaning your data. So in this section, I'm going to teach you a bunch of different advanced functions. And I use the term advanced very reluctantly because these are all pretty simple functions once you get the hang of them. So by the end of this section, you'll know how to do VLOOKUPs, INDEX MATCHES, uh, IF STATEMENTS AND OTHER CONDITIONAL FUNCTIONS, AND WE'LL EVEN GET INTO ARRAYS. ALSO, I PROVIDED A LINK TO MICROSOFT EXCEL'S BUILT-IN FUNCTIONS LIBRARY, WHICH EXPLAINS WHAT EACH FUNCTION IS AND HOW TO USE EACH FUNCTION. SO IF YOU EVER HAVE ANY QUESTIONS ABOUT ANY OTHER FUNCTIONS THAT I DON'T COVER, uh, USE THAT LINK SO YOU CAN LEARN MORE ABOUT IT. BUT IF YOU'RE IN ANY SORT OF POSITION OR A JOB THAT REQUIRES YOU TO USE EXCEL A WHOLE LOT, you should definitely learn these ones that I'm gonna cover. They have the ability to make your job so much easier and save you so much time. So let's start with the VLOOKUP. Okay, so right now we're looking at a bunch of different sales transactions. This is in the invoice worksheet in the file named VLOOKUP, okay? So in column A, we have the transaction number. That's just basically a transaction ID. In column B, we have the SKU. A SKU um, is, is sort of like a product ID. In column C, we have the quantity. And in column D, we have the sales price, okay? And in column E, we have the total price. And that's just the quantity times the sales price, okay? So what do we want to do here? We want to figure out what our total profit is going to be for these nine different transactions. So what is profit? Well, profit is the sales price minus the cost. So how do we know the cost? Well, in this worksheet called inventory, 
Here we have a list of all of the different products along with the quantity on hand and the average cost. So the cost is actually here in this table in, in column C. So if we come back into our invoice worksheet and then we look at B2 here and we, we find this SKU, this LAC-914 on, on, on our inventory list, LAC-914, we see that the price is 786. So we can copy this into our invoice worksheet right here in column G under cost per unit. And that's one way of getting the cost into column G. But there's got to be a smarter way. And there is the VLOOKUP function. The VLOOKUP function looks for a value in the leftmost column of a table and then returns a value in the same row from a column you specify. So first let's get rid of the data in G2 and then let's initiate the VLOOKUP function. Okay, and now you see it pops up, so let's double click on it. And now the first argument is the lookup value. Well, the lookup value is gonna be the SKU. Okay, so cell B2. Now it's asking us for the table array. Well, the table array is gonna be the inventory table. So let's come over here and select cells A1 through C14. And now it's asking us for the column index number. Well, the column index number is the column that has the field that we're looking for. So in this case, we're looking for the cost. So that's in the third column of this data. So we're gonna type a three here. And now it's asking us if we wanna use an approximate match or an exact match. Well, we wanna use an exact match because we wanna match the SKU exactly. So let's type false for exact match. And I'll show you how approximate match works later on in this video. Okay, so now let's close out our parentheses and let's hit enter on the keyboard. And now you see that it's using a VLOOKUP to return the value of 786. Now let's go back into the formula because I wanna point something out. The table array is cells A1 through C14 in the inventory worksheet. But look what happens when we copy these, this formula down. Now the table array is A2 through C15. And if I copy it down one more, you'll see that it's A3 through C16. And that's because we're using relative cell references. So let's go back into the original formula, okay? And where it says A1 through C14, let's fix these into place by using the dollar symbols. So we could come into this formula and type dollar symbols before our cell ranges, or we could just hit the F4 button in each cell. And that fixes it into place for us. And now we could come back up here and we can copy these formulas down by using an autofill. And if we come over here into G10, we see that it's still fixed into place. But what happens if we add a new product and then we try to do the VLOOKUP? Well, let's try it. Let's come here into row 11 and let's right click it and let's hit insert. And that inserts a row above, okay? And now let's call this transaction 10. And for the SKU, let's call this new dash SKU. Let's order one. Let's say the sales price is 100. Let's expand that. And now let's copy the formula here down into G11. And as you can see, it's showing up as hashtag NA. This means that it can't find the SKU on the inventory list. Well, that's because it's not on there. So let's add it. So let's type new dash SKU here. For the quantity, let's type 500. And for the cost, let's say 50. But something's still gonna be wrong here. Let me show you. If we come back here, we see that it still says hashtag NA. And that's because the table array is cell A1 through C14, but we just added a new SKU to cell C15. So we need to come back into this formula and change it to C15. And now we see that it's working. Well, what if we constantly add new products to our inventory list? Well, then that means we have to constantly update the VLOOKUP formulas. So let me show you what I like to do in order to prevent myself from having to constantly update the VLOOKUP formula. So first of all, let's delete all of these formulas in column G. And let's come back into cell G2. And let's initiate the VLOOKUP. 
the look of value is still going to be cell B2. But now the table array, instead of being cell A1 through C15, let's do column A through column C. Okay, that's what I always like to do when I'm doing a VLOOKUP. Because if I ever add any new products, this will make sure that it's always included in the table array. Okay, the column index number is still going to be 3 and we're still going to say false for approximate or exact match. Now let's do an autofill here to copy these formulas down. And now we have the cost per unit in column G. Now there's a couple of more things that I wanted to point out. The lookup value is not case sensitive. So if we type this in lowercase, it's still going to work. Also, if you have duplicate values in your table array, it's always going to return the first instance of that value. So let's come over here into this inventory table and let's copy this new SKU into A16. And for the quantity this time, let's say 100. And for the, the cost this time, let's say 10. Now, if we come back into the invoice worksheet, we see that the cost per unit for new SKU is still 50 because it found the first instance of new SKU. So if we delete this first instance and we come back into this invoice, now it's showing 10 as cost per unit because we got rid of the other instance where the cost was 50. So let's get rid of this new SKU and let's get rid of it on the inventory list as well. And let's come back into the invoice and now let's calculate the total cost. Well, that's going to be the cost per unit times the quantity. And let's do an autofill to copy these formulas down. Okay, now we have our cost. Now let's calculate our profit. So the profit is going to be the total price minus the total cost. And for this, let's do an autofill and copy this all the way down. And now we can do an auto sum by hitting all equal. And that's going to give us the total profit. So let's expand this. And now we see the total profit of $146.38. So the VLOOKUP helped us in coming up with this calculation. Now let's do one more VLOOKUP to come up with the quantity on hand okay so let's do the VLOOKUP function okay the lookup value is going to be B2 still and now the table array is going to be A through B okay we can actually say A through C if we wanted to and then for the column index number put 2 and it still will work for us and you see now it's working and it gave us the quantity available. So let's do an autofill and copy this formula down. And now we have all the different quantities on hand for all these different SKUs. Now I told you I was going to explain what an approximate match was, but I strongly suggest that you never ever use it because it could get you into lots of problems. So if we come into cell F2, we see that the quantity available is 52. But if we come into this formula and we change this last argument to true, okay, that way we allow an approximate match, okay, and we hit enter, it still says 52, but look what happens if we change this skew around slightly, okay, so let's get rid of the one at the end. Now it's saying that the quantity available is 122. Well, that can't be right. That's why I suggest to never ever use it because it gets you into all kinds of problems. But let me show you what it could theoretically be used for, even though I suggest never using it for this. So first of all, let's fix this. Let's come back to the skew and put a one at the end, which was the original skew. And now for this original VLOOKUP formula, let's change the last argument back to false. Okay, now everything's back how it was. But let's add a new sheet, okay? And in cell A1, let's type the value 21. Okay, in cell A2, let's type the value 29. And then A3, let's type the value 31, okay? Bear with me. Also, let's add a header here. Okay, so let's call this first column um, skew. Let's call this second column cost. Now let's come into this inventory worksheet and let's add some new products. Now the first SKU for this new product, let's call it 20. Okay, let's say that the quantity on hand is 100 and that the cost is $10. And now let's add another product with the SKU of 30. 
let's say that there's 500 on hand and that the cost for this is 50. Okay, now let's come back into sheet one and let's do a V a V lookup for this first SKU, but let's do an approximate match. Okay, so let's do V lookup. The lookup value is A2. The table array is going to be A through C. Okay, and the column index number is going to be three. And for approximate match, we want to say true. Okay. Now it's returning a cost of ten dollars. Well, where did it get ten dollars from? Well, because we're using an approximate match, it found the closest value to this twenty-one. Okay, so if we go to the inventory sheet, we see that the closest value to that twenty-one is twenty. Okay, and that cost is ten dollars. So what happens if we copy this formula down? Well, for the SKU 29, it still returned the value of 10. Okay, if we come over here to the inventory sheet, we see the $10 corresponds to the SKU 20. Well, 29 is closer to 30 than it is to 20. So how come it still returned the value of 10? Well, it kind of works like the price is right. It has to find the, the most approximate value without going over. So that's how approximate match works. So let's delete this worksheet, okay? Let's come into this inventory list and let's delete those last two SKUs that we added. And let's come back into the invoice and let's take time and appreciate what we just accomplished because we learned how to do a VLOOKUP and now we're halfway to becoming Excel masters. Now there's one last thing that I want to point out. You can use a VLOOKUP or any formula for that matter and reference data from entirely different workbooks. So let me show you what I'm talking about. I have a file here called inventory and this is basically the same exact inventory list except it's in its own workbook. So if I come back into my VLOOKUP formula here in cell F2, I can replace this table array with a new table array that's referencing the new workbook that I have open. So let me come into this new file that I have open and let's select columns A through C. And now if I hit enter, you see that now it's referencing the inventory.xlsx workbook, okay? And if I copy this formula down, by using an autofill, now they're all referencing the uh, new workbook. Now, if I close this workbook, now you see that it's referencing the actual path that this workbook is located. Now, one last thing. Let's remember this SKU here, LAC-914. And let's remember that the quantity available is 52. Okay, let's save this file. Okay, and you can save a file by hitting control S on the keyboard. That's the keyboard shortcut. And let's close this file out and let's open this inventory workbook back up. Now let's come to this uh, SKU that says LAC-914 and let's change the 52. Let's change that to 1000. Okay. And let's save this file and close it out. Now let's reopen our VLOOKUP work workbook and now you, you get a security warning right here automatic update of links has been disabled okay and you can still see that the quantity available is 52 okay but if I enable the automatic update of links now you see that it changes to 1000 so that's how VLOOKUPs and links work in Microsoft Excel but the VLOOKUP formula only works when the lookup value is on the left. What if the skew was on the right? Well, in that case, we would have to use different formulas. We would have to use a nested index and match function, which we'll talk about in the next video. So let's talk about the index and match functions. So in the index match workbook, we have pretty much the same exact data as the VLOOKUP workbook. But the only difference is, if you come over here into the inventory worksheet, you'll see that the SKU is on the right. And I did that on purpose because I wanted to show you how you can use a nested function using the index and match functions in order to look up the quantity available and the average cost. Okay, so let's come back into the sales worksheet and let's come into cell F2. 
So we want to find the quantity available for this SKU right here, LAC-914-351. Okay, so we're going to do that by using an index formula. So let's begin by typing the index formula. Okay, let's double click on this. And now it's asking us for the array. The array is the range of cells that contains the value that you're looking for. So that's going to be A1 through A14. And now let's type comma. And now it's asking us for the row number. Well, the row number is going to be 9 because that's where this LAC-914 SKU is located. So let's type 9 here. And then let's close out of this function. And now we see that the quantity available for this SKU is 52. Now I wanted to point something out. For the array, we chose cells A1 through A14. Okay, but let's suppose that instead of choosing cells A1 through A14, we selected cells A2 through A14 because we didn't feel like including the headers, okay? Well, now if we leave the row number at 9, this is going to be messed up. Okay, now it's showing 582. Well, what is 582? Well, that's row 10. This is because when we chose 9 as the row number, 9 is referring to the row in relative terms, not in absolute terms. So we would need to change that to 8 if we're not including cell A1. So let's come back into the formula and let's change this 9 to an 8. And now you see it's referencing the correct row. But like I always try to suggest, instead of selecting cell range A2 through A14, let's select the entire column, okay? So let's come over here into inventory and let's choose column A. And now let's change this back to nine. And now we get the correct quantity available. Now I know what you're thinking. If we had to manually type row nine in this formula, then what the hell is the whole point of even using this formula? Well, that's where the match formula comes into play. So let me show you the match formula on its own. So let's delete this existing index formula and let's begin by typing the match function. Okay, and now it pops up. And now it's asking us for the lookup value. Well, the lookup value is going to be B2, the SKU. And now it's asking us for the lookup array. So let's come over here into inventory and let's choose C, because this, this is the array that contains the lookup value that we're looking for. And again, I like to choose the entire column. And now it's asking us for the match type. We learned about exact matches and approximate matches in the VLOOKUP video, but for this, we want to use an exact match. So let's type zero. Okay, and now let's close the um, parentheses. And now we see nine. So the match function provides us with the row that contains the SKU that we're looking for. Okay, in this case, it's row nine. So we can use this match function within our index function in order to come up with the quantity available. So let's go ahead and let's type up the index function. And now for the array, let's come back to inventory and let's choose column A because we want to get the quantity available. And now for the row number, that's where we're going to use the match function because that returned the row number for us. So we can leave that as it is. And now let's close out of the index function. And now we get the quantity available, 52. And if we do an autofill and copy this formula down, now we have the quantity available for all these different SKUs. Now let's do one more index match to get the cost per unit. So let's come over here and let's begin by typing index. And now it's asking us for the array. Well, this time the array is going to be column B because we want to get the cost. Now for the row number, we can use the match function. Now it's asking us for the lookup value. So let's come back into the sales worksheet and let's choose B2 for the lookup value. And for the lookup array, that's still going to be column C because that's where the SKU is located. And for the match type, that's going to be zero. Okay, and now we close out the match function and we do one more close parentheses to close out the index function and hit enter. And now we got the cost per unit, 786. And let's just confirm that this is correct. LAC-914 is the SKU. So let's come into the inventory list. LAC-914, that also has a cost of 786. So we know it's correct. So let's come back into the sales worksheet and let's do an autofill 
okay? And now we have the cost per unit for all the different SKUs, and that allowed us to calculate the total cost and the total profit. And that's how you can use the index and match functions when you can't use a VLOOKUP. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about the IF function. The if function checks whether a condition is met or not and it returns one value if the condition has been met and it returns a different value if the condition has not been met. So here we have a worksheet called sales. This is in the if functions workbook and in this worksheet we have a bunch of different sales transactions similar to the previous example. And what we want to do in this particular example is we want to make sure that we have enough quantity on hand for each of these SKUs, okay, in order to fulfill these purchases. So let me show you what I mean. For this first transaction, we have an order for 389 units. This is for EW-8624. But if you come over here into the inventory wor worksheet, we see that for this SKU, EW8628, we only have 259, so we don't have enough to fulfill this order. And we wanna use an if statement in order to figure out if we have enough quantity on hand in order to fulfill all of these purchases. So first of all, let's do a VLOOKUP here in order to determine what our quantity available is for each of these different SKUs. Okay, so the, the lookup value is gonna be the SKU, so B2. The table array is gonna be columns A through C. And then the column index number is gonna be two because we wanna grab that second column there, the quantity available. And now we wanna do an exact match. So let's type false. And now we have the quantity available for this first SKU. So let's do some autofill here and get the quantity for the rest of these SKUs. Now in one of the earlier videos, I mentioned Booleans and I explained that there's three different cell types. There's text, numbers, and Booleans. Well, I'm gonna show you what a Boolean is right now, okay? So let's come over here to column F and let's insert a column uh, before that, okay? And let's call this column Boolean. Okay, now what is a Boolean? A Boolean is a binary variable with two possible values, true and false. So we wanna find out if the quantity available is greater than or equal to the purchase quantity. Well, let's come over here into cell F2 and let's type the following formula, equals E2 greater than or equal to C2. So we're saying is the quantity available greater than or equal to the purchase quantity. So when we hit enter, we see that it's showing up as false. So now we have a Boolean in cell F2 and the value for this particular one is false. Now if we do an autofill and copy these formulas down, we see a couple of other false uh, values and that's basically saying that the quantity available is less than the purchase quantity. So if we go back into this formula, we'll see this greater than or equal to symbol, and this represents a logical operator. So let me explain to you all of the different types of logical operators. The first and most obvious logical operator is the equal to symbol. Then you have the greater than symbol. Next, you have the less than symbol. Then you have the greater than or equal to symbol, which is the one that we used in our formula. And then you have less than or equal to. And last but not least, you have the not equal to logical operator, which is represented by a less than symbol followed by a greater than symbol. So going back to our example, it's checking to see if E2 is greater than or equal to C2. So if E2 is greater than or equal to C2, then it returns the value of true. If it's not, then it returns the value of false. So we can use this Boolean in our if function. And let me show you how. So let's come over here into G2. And let's type up our if function. And now you see it pops up. And now it's asking us for the logical test. Well, the logical test is going to be F2. So it's seeing if F2 is true or false. And now let's hit a comma. 
Now it's saying if the value is true, then what do we want to do? Well, in this case, we want to calculate the total sales price, which is the quantity times the sales price. And now let's hit comma. And now it's asking us what we want to do if the value of, is false. Well, if the value is false, we want to display the text not enough in stock. Let's close out our quote and let's close out the parentheses and let's hit enter. And now you're seeing for this particular uh, transaction, there's not enough in stock. But if we do an autofill and expand this column, we see the, the total sales price for all the ones that have enough in stock. And then all the ones that don't have enough in stock, we see the text that we provided in the if statement. Now, instead of doing our logical test in column F, we can actually do it within our if function. So first of all, let's get rid of column F, all right? And let's go back into our if function. And now you see hashtag ref because we got rid of the cell reference that was in this formula. So let's get rid of that. And now let's do the same logical test that we did in our Boolean column that we just got rid of. So we wanna say E2 is greater than or equal to C2. And now let's do an autofill and copy these formulas down. And now you see pretty much the same exact result as before, except all of it is being done within the if statement now. But in this particular example, we're only checking to see if one condition is true. We're trying to see if the quantity available is greater than the purchase quantity. But what if there's multiple conditions that need to be met in order to perform an action? Well, let's take a look at an example. So here we have a list of a bunch of different bachelors. Okay, this is in the if multiple conditions workbook. In column A, we have the bachelor's name. And in columns B through D, we have their looks, career, and personality rated on a scale of 1 to 10. And Elizabeth is looking at this uh, worksheet, and she's trying to figure out which of these guys is dateable and which aren't dateable. But she has a pretty simple set of standards. She wants to make sure that their looks, career, and personality are all sixes and above. If one of these categories is a five or below, then in her eyes, these bachelors are not dateable. So we're gonna have to use an if statement with multiple conditions in order to figure this out. However, the if function only checks to see if one condition is true. So how do we check to see if multiple conditions are true? Well, for that, we're gonna have to use an and function. So let's come over here into E2 and let's begin by typing the and function, okay? And now it's asking us for the first logical test. Well, the first logical test is going to be to see if B2 is greater than or equal to 6. Because remember, we wanted to see if each of these different categories is a 6 or above. Okay, now let's type a comma. Now it's asking for the second logical test. Well, that's going to be if C2 is greater than or equal to 6. And let's hit one more comma. And now it's asking for the third logical test which is gonna be if D2 is greater than or equal to six, okay? And you could do as many logical tests as you need, but for this particular example, we only need to do these three logical tests. Now let's close out of this function and let's hit enter. And now we see that this first uh, individual, Arnold, is dateable. So if we copy this down to the second bachelor, Tom, we see that he is not dateable. It's returning the value of false because he may have good looks and a good career, but his personality sucks. So he's not dateable. Now let's do an autofill. And now we see whether or not each of these individuals is dateable, but we don't want it to return the value of true or false. We want it to return the value of yes or no. So we're gonna have to use this logical test that we have here within our if statement, okay? So let's initiate the if statement, okay? And now the first logical test is already in here. We wanna use the same logical test. And now the value if true is yes, and the value if false is gonna be no. And let's close out this if statement. And now let's do an autofill and have these copy all the way down. And now we could see who's dateable and who's not dateable. And it's showing up as either yes or no, which is exactly what we wanted.
Now, let's suppose that Elizabeth is a little bit shallow and she's willing to make an exception on the career and personality if their looks are a 10, okay? Well, it's going to look a little something like this. Each of these men will be dateable if their looks, career, and personality are all sixes and above or, keyword or, their looks are a 10. So we're going to have to use the OR function for this. So let's come over here into cell F2 and let's begin typing the OR function, okay? And now it's asking us for the first logical test, okay? So that's going to be if the looks, so B2 equals 10, okay? Because we said if their looks are a 10, then nothing else matters, okay? And then the second logical test, that's going to be where we add the AND function. So we want to say B2 is greater than or equal to 6, comma, C2 is greater than or equal to 6, comma, and D2 is greater than or equal to 6. And let's close out the, the AND function, and now we need to cl close out the original OR function. Let's hit Enter, and now we see TRUE because one of those conditions was met. But if you look at Tom, originally we determined that he was not dateable. But with this new logic, he should be dateable because his looks were a 10. And now you see that it returns the value of true. But we don't want this showing up as true or false in column F. We want this in the original IF formula in column E. So let's get rid of all of the data in F. Okay. And let's come over here to E2 and let's change this formula around. So right before the AND, we're going to put the OR. And the first logical test is going to be if the looks are a 10. So let's say B2 equals 10. And let's type a comma. Now the second logical test we already have in there, which is checking to see if each category is a 6 or above. Okay. So let's come to the end of the AND statement. And now we need to end the OR statement that we just began. And now let's hit ENTER. Okay, and let's do an autofill. And now you see which guys are dateable with the new criteria. And as you can expect, Tom is now dateable because his looks are a 10, even though his personality is a 2. And that's how you do if statements with more than one condition. But in this example, there's only two possible values, yes or no. But what if there was more than two possible values? What if there was three or maybe even four? Well, in that case, you're going to have to use a nested if function. So let's take a look at the file called nested if. And let's take a look at column A. In column A, we have a bunch of different light colors. And in column B, we want to determine the action depending on the light color. Well, we know for red, we're going to have to stop. For yellow, we're going to have to slow down. And for green, that means go. So let's begin by opening the if statement. And now for the first logical test, let's say A2 equals red. And for if statements, it is not case sensitive. So what value do we want to return if A2 equals red? Well, we want to return the value of stop. Now it's asking us what value do we want to return if A2 is not red. Well, we don't know because we still need to check if it's yellow or green. So now we need to do another if function. And now for this logical test, we can say A2 equals green. So if A2 equals green, now if that's true, we want to return the value of go. And if this is not true, then there's only one other action, and that's going to be to slow down. So let's close out the second if function, and now we need to close out the original if function, and let's hit enter. Okay, so we see for red, it says to stop. So let's do an autofill. Okay, and now we see for yellow, it says to slow down. For green, it says to go. So we know this is working right, and that's how you do a nested if function. So in the previous video, we talked about the if function. Now in this video, I want to talk about the if error function. Now let's take a look at the if error worksheet in the if error workbook. In column A, we have a number. And in column B, we have a divisor. And in column C, we have a calculation. It's the number, so A2 
divided by the divisor. So 25 divided by 5 equals 5. 52 divided by 13 equals 4. Okay, and so on down the list. But when we try to do 54 divided by 0, well, that gives us an error because you can't divide a number by 0. And it gives us this little divide by 0 error, okay? And in the next row, we're saying 34 divided by Z, and that's giving us this hashtag value error. Okay, so these cells are error cells. And in cell C7, we're trying to do a total, but it's not working because we have all of these cells with errors. So the if error function will tell Excel what action to do if there's an error in a value. So let's come up here into cell D2 and let's initiate our if error. Now it's asking us what value do we want? Well, we want to do A2 divided by B2. Now let's hit comma. Now it's asking what value do we want if there's an error? So let's put in quotations, not a valid value. And let's close the quotations. And now let's close the if error formula. Okay, now let's do an autofill and let's bring these formulas down. And you can see for rows five and six, it's showing not a valid value. And now we're able to properly calculate the sum because it ignores those text strings. So that's how an if error function works, but I want to show you a more practical example. So let's come over here into the sales worksheet. And this is a similar worksheet to some of the other ones we worked on earlier. And in column D, we have the total price, which is the sales price times the quantity. And in column E, we want to figure out the cost, which is in this inventory list. Okay. And then in column F, we want to calculate the profit, which is the price minus the cost. Well, in order to do the cost, we need to do a VLOOKUP. So let's do the VLOOKUP, which we learned about earlier. The lookup value is going to be A2. The table array is going to be column A through C. And then the column index number is going to be 3 because we want that third column. And then we're going to type false for exact match and let's hit enter and now we see that the cost is not available because it's not on this inventory list but we actually have two inventory lists so this particular SKU is on the second inventory list so if it's not on the first inventory list then we want to do a look up to the second inventory list in order to find it well for this we're gonna have to do an if error formula so let's go back into the formula and let's type if error and now for the first value we want the original VLOOKUP that we have on here but if if that returns an error then we want to do another VLOOKUP and the lookup value is still going to be cell A2 but this time the table array is going to be in the worksheet inventory list number two and it's going to be a through c and then the column index number is still going to be three and then we're still going to say false and now we close out the v lookup but now we also need to close out the if error function and hit enter okay now we see the cost 786 for this particular skew because it checked the first inventory list it couldn't find it so it returned an error but then it checked the second inventory list once it realized that there was an error in the first VLOOKUP. So let's do an autofill and copy these formulas down. And now we have all of our cost and we were able to calculate the profit. Now in this lecture, I'm gonna go over the sum if, count if, average if, max if, and min if functions. Now this might sound a little bit overwhelming right now, but they're all pretty easy functions to learn and they all basically work the same exact way. So let's take a look at the box scores worksheet in the NBA sum ifs workbook. So in columns A through F, we have a bunch of data related to NBA box scores. So basically it has every single player's fantasy points for every game during the 2018 slash 2019 season. So in column A, we have the date. In column B, we have the player's name. In column C, we have the player's position. In column D, 
we have the team that the player plays for. In column E, we have the opponents, so the team that the player went up against on that evening. And then in column F, we have their fantasy points for that specific game. So let's put a filter on this data by hitting Control Shift L. Okay, and let's go to the player, so column B, and let's search for Stephen Curry. And let's filter for Stephen Curry. And now we see all of his games during the NBA season. Now let's suppose that we wanted to see what Stephen Curry's total fantasy points were. So everything in column F for the 2018-2019 season. Well, let's come here into cell F3. And let's go down to the bottom of this range. So let's hit Control Shift and the down arrow. And now we have all of these cells selected. And if you look here at the bottom right hand corner, you'll see that the total, so the sum of all of his uh, fantasy points is 3,026.4. You also see that there's a count and the count is 68. That means there were 68 games that he played in during the season. And then the average is 44.5. Okay, so let's go back up to the top of this range and let's turn off the filter. Now there's another way to calculate Stephen Curry's total fantasy points without having to put a filter on, and that's the sum if formula. So let's come over here into cell I2 and let's initiate the sum if formula. So we want to choose this first one, sum if. Now it's asking us for the range. Well the range is going to be the range of cells that contain the player's name because we want to find Steph Curry. So let's choose column B as the range. And like I said, I like selecting columns rather than selecting cell ranges. And now it's asking us for the criteria. Well, the criteria is going to be the name of the player. So in this case, the criteria is going to be cell I2 because we have the player's name here. And now the sum range is going to be column F because that's where all of his fantasy points were. So let's close out this function. And if I did this correctly, it should return that same total as before, the 3,000 26 I believe and it did now remember in our formula the criteria is referring to cell I2 here so if I wanted to I can change the player's name so let's type LeBron James here and now you see that the total points changes to reflect this so remember this number here 2924.5 so let's go into column B and let's put a filter on for LeBron James just to check and make sure we got it right and if we select all of these cells here, we see that the total is 2,924.5. So we know that it's working correctly. Now remember this number right here, the count, 56. Now let's go back to the top of this data. Let's turn off the filter. And let's come into cell I4 here. So in this cell, we want to figure out how many games LeBron James played. Well, we can use a count if formula in order to determine this. So let's initiate the count if formula. And now it's asking for the range. Well, the range is going to be the range that has the player's name. So it's going to be column B. And now the criteria is going to be the player's name, which is right here in cell I2. Now let's close out the parentheses. And if I did this correctly, it should show 56, which we determined was the count. And it did show 56. So we know that this is working correctly. Now, if we wanted to calculate LeBron James average, we can use a simple division formula here. It's going to be cell I3 divided by cell I4. So his total points divided by his total games played. And now we see his average is 52.2. But there's also another formula that I want to show you called the average if formula. So let's use the average if formula instead, just so you can see how to do it. So let's begin by typing up the formula. And now here you see it, average if. So let's click on that. And now it's asking for the range. Well, the range is going to be the range that has the player's name. So that's going to be column B. And now the criteria is going to be the player's name. So that's going to be cell I2. And now it's asking for the average range. Well, that's the range of cells that has the fantasy points. So that's going to be column F. And let's close out the parentheses and let's hit enter. And now we see that same average, 52.2. And I want to point something out. The average if formula pretty much works the same exact way as the sum if formula. So if you look at the average if formula, the range is column B, the criteria 
is cell I2, and then the average range is column F. And if we come into cell I3 and we look at the sum if formula, we see the same exact parameters for this formula. The range is column B, the criteria is cell I2, and the sum range is column F. Okay, so when I said earlier in this video that they all pretty much work the same exact way, that's what I meant. The only difference is the function name. Now let's not worry about the best game and worst game yet. We'll look at that later. But let's suppose that we had more than just one criteria because in this example, we only had one criteria and that was the player's name. But what if we had more than one criteria? So let's come into cell I10 here and what if we wanted to figure out what Stephen Curry's total was against the Clippers? That's what the abbreviation LAC stands for. Well, now we have two different sets of criteria. We have the player's name and we have the opponent that he went up against. So now instead of using the sum if function, we're going to have to use the sum ifs function. So let's begin by typing the sum ifs function. Okay, and now let's choose it from this list. We don't want to choose the sum if function. We want to choose the sum ifs. And now it's pretty much the same as before, except the parameters are in a different order. The first thing that it's asking for is the sum range. So that's going to be the range of cells that have the, the fantasy points. So if you re remember from before, that was column F. Now it's asking us for criteria range 1. Okay, so that's going to be column B because that's where the player's name was. And now it's asking us for the first criteria. That's going to be the player's name. Now it's asking us for criteria range number two. Well, that's going to be the opponent, so column E. And then the criteria number two is going to be cell I12, or I'm sorry, I11 here. And you could add as many different uh, criteria as you need, but in this case, we only need two different criteria. So let's close out the function and let's hit enter. And now it's showing that Stephen Curry scored a total of 100.2 points against the LA Clippers this season. And let's do a filter and figure out if that's correct. So let's come over here to player and let's type Stephen Curry. And now let's come over here to opponent and let's filter for um, LAC, which is the Clippers. And now we see he has two games against the Clippers and his total is 100.2. Okay, so let's turn off these filters. And let's come into cell uh, I13 here. And now we want to figure out the games played. Well, that's going to be the same as before, except we're going to use the count ifs formula. Okay, now it's asking us for criteria range number one. Well, that's going to be the range of cells with the player's name. And now it's asking us for criteria one. That's going to be the player's name. And now it's asking us for criteria range number two. That's going to be column E, where it has the opponent's teams. And now let's hit comma. And now it's asking us for criteria number two. And that's going to be cell I11 over here. Now let's close out the parentheses. And if this worked correctly, it should say two. Because he played two games against the LA Clippers. And it is showing two. So that's working fine. Now we want to figure out the average fantasy points for Stephen Curry. And same as before, we could do a calculation and take this 100.2 and divide it by two. Or we can use the average ifs formula. So let's use the average ifs formula. Now it's asking for the average range. Well, that's going to be column F still. The criteria range number one is going to be column B. The criteria number one is going to be cell um, I10 here. And now criteria range number two is going to be the opponent. And then criteria. The criteria number two is going to be cell I11 over here. And let's close out this function and hit enter. And now we see the average of 50.1. Now let's come back into cell I6 over here. And we want to figure out what LeBron James's best game was for the season. Well, we're going to have to use a max if formula. Except there is no max if formula. For some reason, there's only a max ifs formula. So the ones with multiple criteria. But we don't have to use more than one criteria, even if you're using a max ifs formula. So let's type it up. And now you see it pops up. 
and now it's asking for the max range. Well, that's going to be column F, okay? And now it's asking for criteria range number one, so that's going to be column B, and then criteria number one is going to be LeBron James. Now let's close out the parentheses, and that's the only criteria we have for this example. So let's hit enter, and now we see LeBron James' best game. He scored 77.5 fantasy points. Now we can use a min-ifs formula to figure out his worst game. And again, there's no min if formula, there's only min ifs, okay? So let's initiate this formula, and now let's choose column F for the min range. For the criteria range, let's choose column B, and then for the criteria, let's choose LeBron James. Okay, so the same as the max ifs formula, it's just a different function name. Now let's close out this function and hit enter. And now we see that LeBron James' worst game, he scored 23.7 fantasy points. Now let's do a max ifs formula with multiple criteria. So let's come down here into cell I-15 and let's do a max ifs formula to figure out what Steph Curry's best game was against the LA Clippers, okay? So now the max range is still going to be column F. Criteria range number one is going to be column B. And criteria one is going to be the player's name, so Stephen Curry. And now criteria range number two, that's going to be the opponent, so column E. And then the criteria number two is going to be cell I-11 over here. Now let's close out this function and hit enter. And now we see that his best game against the Clippers he scored 55.2 fantasy points. So now let's do a min ifs to figure out what his worst game was against the Clippers. So the min range is going to be column F. The criteria range number one is going to be column B. Criteria number one is going to be the player's name. So cell I-10. Criteria range number two is going to be the opponent. So column E. And then criteria two is going to be cell I-11 over here, the opponent. Now let's close out this function, and now we see that his worst game against the Clippers, he scored 45 points. Now let's suppose we want to figure out how many fantasy points Steph Curry scored during a specific time period. Well, we're going to have to get pretty creative with our sum ifs formula. So first of all, let's freeze this top row here. Let me show you how to do that. Let's go to View, and then over here where it says Freeze Panes, click on freeze top row and now if you scroll down the top row is still going to be fixed okay and let's come over here into cell I-22 and now we want to figure out what Stephen Curry's total was for the month of March so we have a begin date here in cell I-20 and we have an end date here in cell I-21 so in order to do that we're gonna have to use the sum ifs formula so let's initiate this formula and now the sum range is still going to be column F. Criteria range number one is still going to be column B. And criteria number one is going to be the player's name. So cell I-19. And now criteria range number two, that's going to be the date column. So column A. And now criteria two, that's going to be where we do something a little bit different. So in quotations, we want to put a greater than or equal to symbol. And now we want to add an ampersand, and then we're going to click on cell I-20 here. So we want it to be greater than or equal to March 1st, 2019. And then criteria range number three, that's also going to be the date column, so column A. And the criteria for this one, it's going to be similar. It's going to be less than or equal to, close out the uh, less than or equal to symbol, and now do an ampersand and let's click on cell I-21 over here which is the end date. Now let's close out the function and let's see what happens. Now it's showing that his total points for the month of March is 622.1. So let's put a filter on Steph Curry to see if this, this is working correctly. So let's come up here to player and let's search for Steph Curry. Okay, let's choose Stephen Curry. And now for the date, we can filter by a month. So let's choose the month of March here. And let's take the total for all these cells. And voila, 622.1. So that's working correctly. So let's take off these filters. And now we want to do a count ifs 
to figure out how many games he played in the month of March. So let's initiate the count ifs formula. And now criteria range number one is going to be column B. Criteria one is going to be the player's name. So cell I-19. Criteria range number two, that's going to be the date column. Criteria number two, that's going to be greater than or equal to, in quotes, followed by the ampersand. And then let's click on the begin date. So cell I-20. And now criteria range number three, that's going to be the date column. And then criteria number three, that's going to be less than or equal to, in quotations, followed by the ampersand, followed by cell I-21, which is the end date. So March 31st, 2019. Now let's close out this function. And now we see that the games played for Steph Curry for the month of March was 14. But let's do another filter just to confirm that that's correct. And when we highlight all of his scores, we see that the count is 14. Okay, so that is working correctly. And his average is 44.35. So we're going to do an average ifs now to come up with that figure. So let's take off these filters. And let's come over here into cell I24. And let's initiate our average ifs formula. So now the average range is going to be column F. Criteria range number one is going to be column B. Criteria number one is going to be the player's name, same as before. Criteria range number two, that's going to be the date column. Criteria number two is going to be, quote, open quote, greater than, equal to, close quote, followed by the ampersand, followed by cell I-20, comma and now criteria range number three that's going to be the date column so column a as well and then criteria number three that's going to be open quote less than or equal to the end date so let's put in an ampersand and let's choose the end date which is cell i21 now let's close out this function and now we see that average that we talked about 44.4 .4. Okay, now let's see what Steph Curry's best game was during the month of March. So we're going to use a max ifs formula. But instead of doing the formula all over again, let's go over here into this formula that we already typed with the average ifs formula. Let's copy this text here and let's come here into cell I-25 and let's paste the text. But let's change the formula name to max ifs. And now we see that Stephen Curry's best game during that time period, he scored 58.5 fantasy points. Now let's come back into this. Let's copy this formula. And let's come over here into cell I-26. And now we want to figure out his worst game during this time period. So let's paste that text that we just copied. And let's change this to say min ifs. And now we see that his worst game during that time period, he scored 24.4 fantasy points. And let's do one more filter just to make sure we did that correctly. And now the, the cool thing is when you come into this fantasy points filter, it's sorted from from smallest to largest. So we see that his best game, or I'm sorry, that his worst game was 24.4 fantasy points. And if we go to the bottom, his best game was 58.5 fantasy points. So it is working correctly. Okay, so let's take off these filters. And now if we wanted to, we could change this to LeBron James. And now we can see what his average was during the month of March. He averaged 52.5 fantasy points. He played a total of 12 games. His total points was 630.7. His best game was 63.7 points. And his worst game was 38.1 points. Okay. Now let's suppose that we wanted to figure out what the best overall game was for any player. And what the second best game was and what the third best was and then let's also suppose that we wanted to figure out what the worst game was what the second worst was and what the third worst game was 
Well, for this, we're going to have to use the small and large functions, which I'm going to talk about in the next video. So we finished off the last video by mentioning that we're going to use the small and the large functions to figure out what the best and the worst overall games were for the NBA season. So if we come up here to the filter for column F, which is the fantasy points column, and we unselect all, and we come all the way to the bottom and select these bottom three scores, which are the highest three scores on this list, we can see that the best game was a 95 point game by James Harden against the Knicks. The second best game was a 92.4 point game also by James Harden. And then the third best game was a 90.1 point game by Carl Anthony Towns, okay? So let's turn this filter off. So we're gonna use the large function in order to figure out what we just figured out. So let's initiate the large function over here in cell I-29. And now it's asking us for the array. So this is gonna be the range of cells that have the fantasy points, so column F. And now it's asking for K. So if we wanna see the first best score, we're gonna put one for K. If we wanna see the second best score, then we're gonna put two. If we wanna see the third best score, we'll we'll put three for K and so on down the list. So for this one, we wanna see the first best game. So let's put one and now let's close out this parentheses. And now we see that 95 point game that we looked at earlier. Okay, now let's do that same formula to figure out the second best game. Okay, so the array is still gonna be column F and K is gonna be two. And we see that 92.4 point game. And if we do one more uh, large function, we can figure out the third best overall game. And that's that 90.1 point game. Now for the, for the worst game, we're going to use this, the small function, which works the same exact way as the large function, just the other way around. So the array is still going to be column F, and then K is going to be 1. And that shows us minus 3. And now the second worst game, let's initiate the small function. The array is still going to be column F and K is going to be 2 because we want to see the second worst game. And that's still negative 3. That means that there's two different occasions when a player scored negative 3 points. And now let's do one more to figure out the third worst game. And now we see negative two, which means the third worst game was a game where someone scored minus two points. And you might be asking, how can you score negative points? Well, in basketball, if you commit a turnover, that counts as negative points towards your fantasy points. So that means these players had really, really bad games. But what we're looking at here are the best and worst overall games. What if we wanted to see LeBron James's first best score and his second best score and his third best score. Well, for that, we're going to have to use an array. So I'm going to talk about arrays in our next video. So we already learned about VLOOKUPs and index matches, but the problem with these functions is that they only allow us to match up single values. But what if we had to do lookups based on multiple criteria? For instance, in this example, which is in the index match array file, we have three different fields. And each of these fields contain different information related to smartphones. In column A, we have the model. Okay, so it's either an iPhone or a Galaxy. In column B, we have the version. So you have the version 9, the X, the XR, the Galaxy 9 or the Galaxy 10. And in column C, we have the storage. Now suppose here in cell H8, we wanted to find the quantity available. And in cell H9, we wanted to find the cost for a particular type of phone based on the values in cells H3 through H5. Well, in order to do that, we're gonna have to use what's called an array. If we try to do a V lookup or an index match, it's not gonna work because we have duplicate values in all of these different cells here. So before I show you how to do it by using an array, I wanna show you a different method that does not involve using an array, but it does involve one extra step. So let's come over here and insert a column to the left, okay, and let's call this column concat. Now in this column, here in cell F2, 
we're going to concatenate the values in A2, B2, and C2. So now you see the concatenated value of these three columns in cell F2. So let's do an autofill and copy that down. And now we can do an index match and match up our lookup value against column F in order to get the quantity and the cost. So let's go ahead and do that. Okay, now the array is going to be column D because we want to find the quantity available. The row number, for the row number, that's where we're going to use the match. And now it's asking for the lookup value. So for the lookup value, we're going to concatenate the values in cells I3 through I5. Now it's asking us for the lookup array. So that's going to be this column F over here, which we just created. And now the match type is going to be zero because we want to do an exact match. And now let's close out the match function. And now let's also close out the index fun function. And now we can see for the iPhone XR 256 gigabytes, the quantity available is 149 units. And if we look on this data set, we see that that's correct. Now let's change this to the iPhone 9, okay? And let's say that it's the 16 gigabyte unit. Now we could see the quantity available for the iPhone 9, 16 gigabyte, which is 358 units. Now let's figure out the cost. So we're gonna use pretty much the same exact formula, except this time the array is gonna be column E instead of column D. Okay, so the array is column E. The row number is gonna be where we use the match formula. And now the lookup value is gonna be the same as before. We're gonna concatenate I3 through I5. The lookup array is gonna be column F. And now the match type is gonna be zero for exact match. Let's close out the match function and let's close, close out the index function. Let's hit enter. And now we see the price for the iPhone 9 16 gigabytes and that's $600, which is correct. Now, like I was saying before, this method involved one extra step because we had to come here and create column F and concatenate all these values here. So if we wanted to avoid this extra step, well, we're going to have to use an array function. So let me show you how to do that. First, let's get rid of column F here. And now let's get rid of these formulas and go back into cell H8 and create a new formula. And we're going to first use the index formula. And now it's asking us for the array. Well, the array is going to be column D because we want to find the quantity available. Now for the row number, we're going to have to type the match function. So, so far, pretty similar. And now the lookup value is going to be the same as before. We're going to concatenate H3 through H5. Let's hit comma. And now it's asking for the lookup array. This is where it gets a little bit different. So for this, we're going to select column A, followed by an ampersand, followed by column B, followed by another ampersand, followed by column C. Now let's hit a comma, and for match type, let's type zero for exact match. Let's close out the match function, and now let's also close out the index function. And something's, something's going to be wrong, and I'll explain to you why. So let's hit enter, and now you see hashtag value. And the reason that says has, hashtag value is because we didn't turn this formula into an array. Okay, the way to turn a formula into an array is to hit control, shift, and enter instead of just hitting enter. Okay, so let's try that. Let's hit control, shift, enter. And now we see... 358 for the quantity available, which we know is correct. And if you look at the formula here in the formula bar here, you see these curly brackets at the beginning and at the end of the formula. That indicates that it is an array function. So let's come back and to cell H9 now, and let's do the same formula, but instead this time, let's look up the cost. Okay, so let's begin by typing the index formula. And now it's asking for the array. So this time it's going to be column E. 
Now it's asking for the, the row number, so we're going to use the match function. The lookup value is going to be the same as before. The lookup array is also going to be the same as before, so it's going to be column A, ampersand, column B, ampersand, column C. The match type is still going to be zero for exact match. And now let's close out the match function and let's also close out the index fun function. And now let's hit control shift enter. And now we see the cost for this iPhone 9 16 gigabytes of $600. And if we look here in row two, we see that that's correct. Now let's change this to Galaxy 9 and now let's say 128 gigabytes. And now we see the quantity and the price for the Galaxy 9, 128 gigabytes, which is 398 available, $650. So we know that this is working correctly. And that's how you look up values with multiple criteria. And you can also use arrays for other things. And let me show you an example of one, which we touched upon at the end of the last video. So let's open up the next file. This is called the NBA small large array file. And you might remember this data set from before. And in the last video, I showed you how to look up the first best, second best, and third best overall games for the season. And I also showed you how to look up the first worst and second worst and third worst overall games for the season. But I ended the last video mentioning that if we're going to want to figure out the first, second, and third best games for a specific player, in this case, Steph Curry, well, we're going to have to use an array formula. So let me show you how to do that. So let's come over here to cell L3 and let's initiate the large function. Now it's asking us for the array. Now here's where it gets a little bit different than the normal large function. So now for the array, we're going to have to initiate an if formula. And now it's asking for the logical test. Well, that's going to be if column B, which contains the player's name, equals cell L2, which has the player's name that we're looking up in this specific case. And now it's asking for the value if true. Well, the value if true, we're going to put column F because we want to grab the fantasy points from column F. And we're not going to have a value if false. So we're just going to end the if function now by closing out the parentheses. And now let's type a comma. And now it's asking us for K. And the K is going to be the same as before. In this particular case, we want the first best overall game. So we're going to type a 1 here. Okay. And now we're going to close out the large function. But wait, now what do we have to do here to ensure that this is an array formula? We have to hit Control shift enter on the keyboard. So when we do that, we see that Steph Curry's best overall game was 71.7 points. Now let's figure out his second best overall game. So let's go into this formula here and let's copy it. And now let's hit escape. That way we don't affect anything here. And let's come over here into cell L4 and let's paste that formula that we just copied. But let's change that 1 to a 2 because we want to find the second best game by Steph Curry. And now let's hit Control shift enter on the keyboard because remember this is an array formula. And now we see his second best game is 64.3 points. And now let's do this one last time except let's find out his third best overall game. So let's change the 1 to a 3 this time because we want to find his third best overall game and let's hit control shift enter and now we see his third best game which is 62.4 points but I want to do something a little bit different here in cell L6 so in cell L6 we want to figure out the fourth best overall game which is what this 4 is for and then in cell L7 we want to figure out the fifth best overall game and in cell L uh, eighth, we want to figure out the sixth best overall game. Well, I want to show you how to do this by using an autofill. So let's type up the function again. The array is going to be the if function. The value if true is still going to be column F. Close out the if function. And now for, for K this time, 
we want K to be cell K6 over here, okay? Because we want to find out the fourth best overall gain. Now let's close out the large function. And now let's hit Control Shift Enter on the keyboard. And now we see Steph Curry's fourth best game for the season. Now for his fifth and sixth best overall games, I want to do an autofill here, but there's one thing that we have to change. Let's go back into this formula. And now where we see that we're referencing cell L2, we need to fix that into place by typing a dollar sign before the row number. So we can type a dollar sign before the row number, okay, like that. Or we can hit F4 on the keyboard. And if we wanted to, we could hit F4 two, two times. That way it's only locking in the row number. And now let's hit Control Shift Enter on the keyboard. And if we drag this formula down here, now we get the fifth and sixth best overall games by Steph Curry. And if we want to, we can change this to LeBron James. And now we see LeBron James's first through sixth best games for the season. Now, what if we wanted to see the same information, but for a specific time period? So let me show you how we would do this. So let's come over here into cell. L14 and let's initiate the large function and now we want to see his best overall game for the month of March so for the array we're gonna to have to type the if function and now for the logical test same as before we're gonna say column B equals cell L11 over here but we're gonna to have to do this a little different now so let's wrap up this first logical test in parentheses and now let's use an asterisk and now we're going to provide the second logical test also in parentheses. So the second logical test is going to be column A to see if the date is greater than or equal to the begin date which is cell L12 over here. Let's close out this parentheses and now let's type one more asterisk and let's provide the third logical test in parentheses and that's going to be if the date so column A again is less than or equal to the end date over here okay so cell L13 now let's close out the parentheses for this third logical test and let's type a comma here and now the for the value if true that's gonna be column F which has the fantasy points okay now let's close out the if function and now let's type a comma and for K we want to find the best overall game so we're gonna type a 1 and now let's close out the large function and now remember to hit control shift enter on the keyboard because this is an array function and now we see Joel Embiid's first best game for the month of March he scored 78 points okay so let's copy this formula here let's hit escape on the keyboard let's come over here into cell L15 and let's paste it but let's change this one to a two because we want to see his second best overall game and let's hit control shift enter and let's do this one more time for his third best overall game let's change that one to a three and let's hit control shift enter now we see his third best overall game but for his fourth through six we're going to do an autofill again. So let's go into cell L17 over here. Let's paste. Let's change this one. Let's get rid of where it says one over here. And let's replace that with cell K17, which has the four. But also, we need to change all these cell references. We need to lock them into place. So let's type F4. Let's come over here where it says L12. Let's hit F4. And let's come over here where it says... Uh, cell L13 and let's hit F4 okay now we fix those into place and let's hit control shift enter and now we see his fourth best game for the month of March and if we do an autofill here we'll see his fifth and sixth best games for the month of March now try to remember these scores the best you can here so we can make sure that it's correct and let's come over here into cell A1 and let's apply a filter by hitting Control shift l on the keyboard. And now we want to filter for Joel Embiid. So let's type Joel Embiid here. Okay. And now we want to filter for the month of March. So let's hit March over here. And let's sort the fantasy points over here in column F. Largest to smallest. 
And now we pretty much see those same exact numbers here. So let's turn off these filters. Now if you wanted to, you could come over here into cells L20 through L25 and you could figure out his first through six worst games, which you already know how to do. You're pretty much going to do the same thing that we just did, except you're going to use the small function instead of the large function. So pivot tables allow us to slice and dice data in order to easily summarize this data. For example, let's look at the worksheet called box scores in the workbook called NBA Pivots. Now you may remember this data set from our previous section, but if you forgot, it basically contains fantasy scores for every player in the NBA for every game in the 2018-2019 season. By the way, if you were wondering, this data is actually real. See, if you come over here into cell A1 and you hit Control shift l on the keyboard, that applies a filter to this data set. And now let's come over here where it says Player, and let's filter for LeBron James. These are all LeBron James' actual games last season. So let's turn off this filter for LeBron James. And now let's create a pivot table. So it's actually pretty easy to create a pivot table. All you have to do is select a cell within our data set, which I already have A1 selected, and come over here into Insert and choose Pivot Table. Now it's saying what range do we want to create a pivot table for? Well, it automatically knew which range to select, so we don't have to do anything with that. Now it's asking us where do we want the report to be placed? Well, we'll put it in a new worksheet, so we'll leave it like that. And now let's click OK. And now we have a pivot table here, but now we need to start adding some information to this pivot table. So let's suppose we wanted to see which player scored the most total points during the season. Well, in that case, we should add the player name to the row area by dragging it like this. Now we have all the player names in one column in the pivot table. Now we want to see what their total fantasy points were, so let's drag the fantasy points field into this values area. And now we see sum of fantasy points, so these are these players' total fantasy points. So if we wanted to see who the top guys were, well we're going to come up here to data and we're going to do a sort Z to A. And now these are all of the top players as far as who scored the most total fantasy points. So now you can kind of see how easy it is to summarize data by using a pivot table. But you can do so much more than just that. So first of all, let's change these headers here by typing directly into them. We'll call this first field player name. And then this second field over here, we'll call it total FP. FP stands for fantasy points. And now we change those headers. Also, we can do an auto size here by double clicking between B and C. But let's suppose now we want to see how many games these players played during the season because some guys play more games during the season than others because, you know, some guys have injuries and things like that. So in order to figure out how many games these guys played, we're going to drag this field, this same field here, fantasy points, down into the values column. But this time we're going to click on this and we're going to choose value field settings. And now we want to see the count. We don't want to see the sum of the fantasy points. We want to see the count because that's going to tell us how many games these guys participated in. So let's hit OK. And now we can see, you know, James Harden played 76 games. Giannis played 72 and so on down the list. So let's change the name of this field to GP, which stands for games played. And let's also do a resize here. And now I want to show you something very important now. Let's suppose that we want to see their fantasy points per game, which is going to be the average. Well, the average is going to be the total fantasy points divided by the games played. So let's come over here into cell D4 and let's type up a formula. But I want to show you what happens when we try to reference a cell from a pivot table. It's referencing its location in the pivot table. So now let's say divided by, and now let's click on the games played over here in cell C4. And now you see that it's doing the same thing. It's referencing its location in the pivot table. Now when we hit enter, 
we still get the average, but look what happens when we try to do an autofill. You see, it's referencing the same player in all these different cells. So if you're going to try to reference cells in a pivot table, then you should type the cell name rather than clicking on the cell. So instead, this time, let's type B4 divided by C4. And now if we do an autofill with this new formula, B4 divided by C4, now we get the averages. But we didn't even need to do that in order to get the averages. Let me show you how to get the averages within the pivot table. So first of all, let's delete this information in column D. And now in order to get back to those pivot table options, we need to click on any cell in the pivot table. Now let's drag fantasy points again to this values area underneath our GP field. And now let's go down to it and click on it and click on value field settings. And this time, let's choose average and now let's hit OK and now we can see the average fantasy points per game so let's change this field name to average FP which stands for fantasy points and also let's change the format of this number here so that it only shows two decimal places so let's go back to where it says value field settings and now let's choose this option here that says number format and let's choose number and now where it says decimal places we'll leave it at two and let's hit OK. Let's hit OK one more time. And now we see it being rounded to two decimal places. So now we have their total fantasy points, their games played and their averages all by doing a pivot table. And we didn't have to do any formulas like we did in the previous section. Now you probably noticed this filter area here in the pivot table options. So let me show you how that works. Now let's suppose that we wanted to get these same values, but we wanted to filter for a specific opponent. So let's say we wanted to see how everyone did against the Golden State Warriors. So what we can do is we can drag this field right here, this opponent field, that's what OPP stands for, into the filter area. So now there's a filter up here being applied to the pivot table, but we haven't actually filtered anything yet. And now let's choose this select multiple items option. Let's uncheck this box here that says all. And now let's find GSW, which stands for Golden State Warriors. And now let's hit OK. And these are all the players totals and averages against the Golden State Warriors. Now it just so happens that the Toronto Raptors are going up against the Warriors in the finals. So let's add one more filter. Let's see how all of the different players on the Raptors have fared against the Warriors. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to add another filter, but this time we're going to choose the team field and drag that over to the filters area. Okay, and now let's come to the new filter that we just applied, the team filter, and let's choose the Toronto Raptors, and that's what TOR stands for, and let's hit OK, and now we have two filters applied. We have a filter for the Toronto Raptors, so we see all the different players on the Toronto Raptors. And we have another filter for opponent where we chose Golden State Warriors. So now we can see how all these different players did against the Warriors during the season. So Kyle Lowry played two games against the Golden State Warriors during the season. He averaged 49.8 fantasy points per game against the Golden State Warriors. So you see how easy it was to find that information by using a pivot table. Now let's suppose that we wanted to see all of the different players from the Warriors and how they did against the Toronto Raptors. Well, let's change the opponent filter. Let's unselect GSW and let's choose Toronto. Let's hit OK. And now our pivot table is empty. That's because the team is still Toronto. We want to change that to the Golden State Warriors. It's empty because the team can't go against themselves, obviously. Okay, so let's unselect Toronto and let's choose GSW for Golden State Warriors. And now we can see how all of the different players on the Warriors did against the Raptors during the season. And I noticed right away Steph Curry only played one game against the Raptors, but he only scored 17.1 fantasy points. So that's their star player and he had a pretty bad game against the Raptors. So that's interesting to see. Now Kevin Durant 
he did pretty good against the Raptors, but Kevin Durant is actually injured right now, so he might not play. So my point of all this is that you can use a pivot table to easily slice and dice your way through data, summarize data, and it helps you analyze your data a lot more efficiently and effectively. Now let's get rid of these filters that we just added. And the way to do that is to come over here to the filters and drag them out of the filter area back into the field area. And now let's suppose that we wanted to see all of the different players, totals, games played, and averages, but for the month of March. Well, in order to do that, we're going to add the, this date field here to the filters area. And now we have a date filter applied. But I want to show you something. Let's come over here to the filter and let's choose this drop down option. And now you can see that you can select and deselect different individual days okay but suppose that you wanted to filter just for the month of March well you don't want to have to come down here and individually select each day of the month for March but luckily there's a little workaround for that so let's come over here and let's hit cancel and now instead of having the date as the filter okay let's drag that over to rows and we want to put that above the player we don't want it below the player we want it above the player. And now we see the date and the player's performance for that date. And if I scroll down, now we see, you know, the second day and all the different players' performance for that day. But that's not what we wanted to do. But I want to show you something. If you come over here to where it says the date and you right click, okay, and now you choose this group option. Now you can group these days into months. So let's choose months, but let's also choose years because we want to group it by the month and the year. And let's hit OK. Now it's all being grouped by the month and the year. So here we have October 2018. And if we scroll down, we should, we should see November 2018 next. There we go. November. December. And now we see 2019 January. But still, that's not a filter for the month of March like we were saying. Sure, we could scroll down to March, but instead we want this as a filter. But now that we have it grouped by the month and the year, well now we can take these fields down here and drag them to the filter. And now we can come up here and we can choose for the year, we can choose 2019. And then in this next field where it says date, that has all of the months, so we can choose March. And that's just a little workaround um, in order to group the dates how you want them to be grouped. Because when you put them into this filters area, there's not a lot of flexibility as to how you can group these dates but when you put them down here into this rows area there's a lot more flexibility and it makes it a lot easier so so what I usually like to do is add it to the rows uh, area group it in the rows area and then drag it back up to the filters area and then I could turn on my filter when I'm dealing with dates because sometimes date filters are a little bit tricky now let's suppose that we wanted to see how each player did during each calendar month of the season. Well, a nice way to do that would be to put the months into columns. So it's pretty easy to do that with the pivot table. First of all, let's take these filters off. So let's select all for the month and let's come over here to the year and select all for the year. And now let's drag these filters to the columns area of the pivot table. And also let's drag this year's filter to the columns table. And we want that to be above, we want the year to be above the date. And we want the date to be above those values. Microsoft Excel automatically added this values field uh, when we were doing the totals and the averages down here. Okay, so now everything is organized into columns and is grouped by year and by month. So here we have October 2018. So James Harden, his average in October was 52. His average in November was 54. 
and his average in December was 56. And then we also have it summarized by year here. So his average for the year 2018 was 55. And then the same applies to all of the different months in 2019. So that's a nice way to organize this. But if we want, if we didn't want these totals here, we could right click on it and we could we could select where it says subtotal year and uncheck that. And now we don't have those subtotals for the year. And there's also going to be totals for this entire data set over here um, at the end. And we can also get rid of those. So if we right click on it, we can say remove grand total right here. And now we don't have those grand totals anymore. We just have all the totals for the different months. But there's also going to be grand totals at the bottom of this data set for all the different players. So let's go to the bottom of this data set by hitting control down arrow. And now let's right click on the grand total here and let's hit remove grand total. Okay, and let's go back up to the top of this data set by hitting control up arrow. Okay, and now we see all of the grand totals are gone and we have a nice clean pivot table. Now let's suppose that we added some more data to our source data. So let's come over here into box scores and let's go to the bottom of this data set by hitting control down arrow. And let's say that on 4-6-2019, I got signed to my favorite team, the Miami Heat. So let's put Adrian P over here. And my position is point guard because I'm too short to play any other position. My team is Miami. And the opponent is, let's just say, Golden State Warriors. And let's say I had a really, really good game. I scored 105 points. Well, now we need to refresh that pivot table in order to see my score here. So let's come over here to sheet two. Let's right click on the pivot table you can right click anywhere in the pivot table and let's hit refresh and now let's come over here to April and let's sort it from high to low for the average because I would be at the top of this list because I had a really good game where I scored over a hundred points and I'm not on here well why am I not on this list because we need to change the source data because we added a new row to that data. So in order to change that source data, let's come over here to Pivot Tables Tools and let's choose this option that says Change Data Source. And now you see that that last row is missing. So let's come back to A1. Let's hit Control Shift Right and then Control Shift Down. And now we have the entire data set selected. And let's hit OK. And now there you see me, Adrian P. I scored 105 points in April, so I have the highest average out of all the guys on this list. Now the only reason it kind of took me a long time to do these pivot tables was because I was explaining it to you, but I want to show you just how quick you can summarize data by using a pivot table. So let's suppose that we wanted to see how all of the point guards, so guys with the position designation of PG. We wanted to see how all the point guards did in the month of April. So let's delete this sheet two here, which has the original pivot table that we created. Okay, let's go back to the top of this data set. And now I want to show you just how fast we can do this. So first of all, let's come over here to insert. Let's choose pivot table. Okay, and it automatically selected the cell range that we wanted it to, and we'll keep it on new worksheet. Let's hit OK. And now we want a position filter because remember, we said we wanted to see just point guards. Let's come over here to this filter and let's choose just the point guards. Let's add the player field to the rows area. And now we have all the different point guards' names here. And now let's add the fantasy points to the values area here, but we don't want to see the sum. We want to see the averages. So let's come over here and let's choose average. Let's come to number format and let's make sure that it has two decimal places. Let's hit OK and let's hit OK. And now we have all the averages for all the different point guards. But 
I also said I wanted to put a date filter for the month of April. So let's come over here to date and let's add that to remember to the, to the uh, rows area because we're going to do that work around that we did before. And now let's come over here. Let's right click on the year and let's say group. And now we want to group by by months and by years. So we got rid of where it grouped it by quarters. Let's hit OK. And now let's drag this years to the top of this filter and let's drag this date here, which is the months to underneath years on the filter. And now we could come over here and we can choose the month of Mar or April, I said, and let's choose the year 2019. And now we have all the averages for the point guards for the month of April. And you see me here at the top and let's just do a sort here. So let's come to data and let's say sort Z to A. And you can see I have the best average for the month of April and then Russell Westbrook right after me. So you see how easy it was to summarize data. That's why the pivot table is such an important tool and it's so powerful. But I wanted to show you one more thing. What if we wanted to see all the games in the month of April that made up this 66.3 point average by Russell Westbrook. Well, all we have to do is double click on this and this will show us all of the records that make up that number. So you could pretty much drill down into anything in your pivot table. So let's delete this. And let's suppose that we wanted to come down to the bottom here. So let's hit control down an arrow and we wanted to, to drill down into this total. So now when we double click on it, we see all of the games in the month of April by all of the point guards. So the drill down feature is a really cool feature within a pivot table and it's very useful. So charts and graphs help us to visualize data so that we can better analyze the data. Let me show you an example of what I'm talking about. So right now we're in the monthly sales worksheet. This is in the graphs and charts workbook. And what we're looking at is a list of budgeted versus actual sales grouped by month. And right now it just kind of looks like a bunch of numbers and it's kind of hard to see what's going on right away without digging a little bit deeper. However, let's come here to the monthly sales graph worksheet. And this bar chart is a visual representation of the data we were just looking at. And it's so much easier to see what's going on when you're looking at the graph. I mean, right away we can see that, you know, in March, sales were really good and they far exceeded their budgeted sales and then we can also see all of the weak months for instance right here they had a really weak month in July their budgeted sales were really high but their actual sales were really low so it's pretty easy to see what's going on when you're able to visualize the data so let's take a look at one more example so if you come to this worksheet called sales by brand here we have a bunch of sales for cell phones grouped by brand and right away, when you look at the pie chart, you see that Apple makes up pretty much half the pie and Samsung is another big seller. And then you have these other smaller cell phone uh, manufacturers that don't quite have as much in sales. So the pie chart is a pretty effective visual tool for something like this. Now I'm going to show you just how easy it is to create a graph in Microsoft Excel. So let's come to this worksheet called Basic Graph. Okay, and here we have in column A a bunch of different sales rep and in column B we have their total sales. So we want to visualize this in some sort of a chart or a graph. So right away an easy way to do this is to click in any cell in this data set. We'll come over here to insert and then we'll choose this option right here recommended charts. And now Microsoft Excel brings up a bunch of different suggestions for charts that we can use. So you get a little preview here on the right hand side as you go through all the different recommended charts. Or if you go into this next tab over here called all charts, now you can see, you know, the different types of charts. Right now we have a column chart and if you hover over them, you could preview it. You can also do a line chart, a pie chart, which we just looked at, a bar chart an area chart, you can even do a scatter chart. So there's all kinds of charts that you can do in Microsoft Excel, but let's go back to recommended charts and let's choose this first chart here. 
And now we created a chart that easily. So let's move this chart by dragging it up here. And let's make it a little bit bigger by dragging the bottom right hand corner. Now there's all different types of ways that we can customize this graph. If we click on anywhere inside the graph, now we get these options right here on the top right hand corner. And if we click on this plus icon and come over here, now it has all the different chart elements and we can add different elements to the chart or we could get rid of uh, different elements of the chart. So right now the total sales is the um, chart title and let's suppose that we didn't want that as the chart title then we could just come over here and uncheck that but we do want that so let's recheck it and let's change the name of that and let's call this sales by rep now let's come back to the chart elements checkboxes and let's add an axis title okay and now we have an axis title here on the y-axis and another one here on the x-axis and we could change the names of these titles so let's call this this one on the x-axis let's call this rep name and now we have all the different rep names on the x-axis and let's call this y-axis title total sales now let's come back into the chart element options and we can also add a legend so if we check this box for legend now we have a legend here on the right hand side and it's saying that the blue represents total sales and if we wanted to we could add data labels so at the top of the bars now it tells you the total sales you can even add a trend line so now we have a trend line here um, so there's all kinds of options to how to customize your graph you can even change the values here in the y-axis so let's right click on this and let's choose format axis and now we can set a minimum and a maximum right now the minimum is zero and the maximum is 350,000 but let's change this maximum to 300,000 Now you see that the maximum is 300,000 and we could even change the units of measure. See right now it's working in increments of 50,000. So if you look here on the left hand side, you see that it goes from 50,000 to 100,000 to 150,000. So let's change these uh, units to 100,000. And now you can see that the y-axis works in increments of 100,000. So you have 100,000, 200,000, 300,000. Or we could even come in and change this to 10,000. And that doesn't look very good, does it? So let's go with the original of 50,000. That looks a lot more clean. Now you can even change the chart type after the chart's been made. So let's say that we wanted this to be a pie chart instead. Well, we could just click on anywhere within the chart, okay? And then we're, we're gonna select this option right here that says change chart type. And then let's come down over here to pie and let's choose this pie chart here. And now we have a nice little pie chart instead of the bar chart. So it's so easy to create and to customize charts in Microsoft Excel. Now let's undo what we just did by hitting control Z that way we could get back to the bar chart, okay? And I wanna show you how graphs and charts can get a little bit more complex, but it's still pretty easy to deal with them. Now let's close out this chart options area on the right hand side. And let's come over here and let's make this um, graph a little bit more narrow. And let's add a field here in column C. Let's call this budgeted sales okay let's do an auto size here and now for the actual budgeted sales let's just use a random function so we'll see we'll say random number between 50,000 and let's say 400,000 let's do an auto fill here and let's copy and paste this as values otherwise it will keep changing now we want to add these budgeted sales to this graph. That way we can see budgeted versus actual sales. So let me show you how to do that. So what you need to do is right click anywhere within the graph 
and then choose this option right here that says select data. And now we want to add something to the legend entries series. So let's click on the add button here. And now it's asking for the series name. Well, for the series name, we could just click on cell C1 budgeted sales. And now for series value, let's get rid of what's in there and let's choose cell C2 through C13 because we want these budgeted sales in there. And now let's hit OK. And now we have the budgeted sales in there. But if you look on this right hand side over here at the horizontal category axis labels, we just have these numbered labels 1 through 12. But we want to change this. We want these labels to be the sales reps names here in column A. So let's hit this edit button and let's choose these reps names over here. So cell A2 through A13 and let's hit OK. Now you can see all the reps names here in the horizontal axis labels. Now let's hit OK. And now we have the budgeted versus actual sales by rep. Now I have these labels here and I want to get rid of them. So one way we could do it is just to select any of these labels and, and Microsoft Excel automatically selects all of them and then hit the delete button on your keyboard. And then we need to delete the other ones as well. So let's select them and let's hit delete on the keyboard. Or we could have done the other thing that we did earlier where we went to the, where we came here to the chart elements and we checked the data labels checkbox in order to add it and then unchecked it to get rid of it. Also, let's get rid of this trend line here. So let's uncheck this box for the trend line. And now we have a nice graph for budgeted versus actual sales by sales rep. Now with this particular set of data, we're really not dealing with that much data. If you come over here, you see that this is only 12 records. So what about when we deal with very large sets of data? So let's take a look at the worksheet called box scores. And as you can see, it has over 25,000 rows. So you can imagine that working with graphs in this particular data set is going to be a lot more complex. So what I suggest to anyone who wants to create graphs and charts for very large data sets such as this one is to create what's called a pivot chart. And I'm going to show you how to do that. So it's pretty easy to create a pivot chart. All you have to do is click any cell within your data set and then come up here to the insert tab and let's choose pivot chart and now it automatically selected the range that we want to select for our pivot chart and now it's asking us where we want the pivot chart to be placed so let's keep it as a new worksheet and now let's hit the OK button and now we're ready to start adding some stuff to our pivot chart now let's suppose that we wanted to see LeBron James's averages by month in a chart format so we're going to approach this the same way we approach pivot tables, which we learned about in the last video. So first of all, we want to filter for LeBron James. So let's come over here and let's drag this player field down into the filters area. OK, now let's come up here to the actual filter and let's choose LeBron James. And let's hit OK. So now we have a filter on for LeBron James. But we also said that we wanted to see his averages by month. So let's come over here and let's drag the date field down to the rows area. But now it's being grouped by year. So if we click on this button, we can expand it. And now we have the year and the quarter. And if we hit it one more time, we can expand it once more. And now we have the year, the quarter and the month. But let's get rid of the quarters because we don't need the quarters. So let's right click on it and let's choose this remove quarters option. Now we just have the year and the month. And now we want to add the fantasy points field over into the values area. But now that's the sum. We want to change that to the average. So let's click on it and let's choose value field settings. And let's come over here and choose this average option. And let's also format it to show two decimal places. So let's choose number and let's keep it at two decimal places. Let's hit OK and let's hit OK one more time. And now we have his averages by month. So let's drag this bottom right hand corner to make this graph a little bit larger. And now we can start customizing this graph the same way that we did before. So let's right click on this axis on this Y axis and let's choose this option for formatting axis. And now we want the minimum value not to be zero. Let's make the minimum value 30. 
and now it automatically changed the the maximum value to 60 and that looks pretty good to me so let's close out this format axis window and let's also close out this pivot chart fields and now we have a good look at our graph and as you can see I mean he's pretty consistent from month to month but it's just a good little visual tool to help us see you know his averages by month and with the pivot chart it makes it so much easier to make graphs and charts for large data sets such as this one